Everybody can uh, take their seats. We're, we're going to begin. Good morning and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. And today we are joined by Council Members Constantinidis, uh, Gradencek, uh, Levin, Richards, uh, Rivera. Uh, today we will uh, hold hearings on a number of applications. If you are here to testify on an item for which the record is not already closed, uh, please fill out a speaker slip and give it to the Sergeant at Arms, indicating your full name, the name and LU number of the application you wish to testify on, and whether you are speaking for or against an item. Uh, please note that we will be laying over resolutions uh, 748 and authorizing resolution pursuant to section 363 of the city charter, also known as the Staten Island bus franchise authorizing resolution. And we will also be laying over LUs 386 to 389, the 1921 Atlantic Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. Uh, I uh, now will hold our public hearings. Uh, our first hearing for today is on LUs 391, 392, for the 1050 Pacific Street rezoning in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning uh, map amendment to rezone an existing M11 district to an M14R7A uh, special mixed use district and a related zoning text amendment to uh, map the site within a mandatory exclusionary housing uh, area with MIH option one and two. As proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new eight-story mixed-use residential commercial building with approximately 103 units, approximately 16,000 square feet of ground floor commercial use, and 42 uh, below-grade accessory parking spaces. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and I would like to turn it over to Majority Leader Cumbo for uh, some remarks. Thank you, Chair Moya, and thank you for all that are here today. We are gathered here this morning for the public hearings on two private rezonings in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. We'll begin with 1050 Pacific Street, followed by 1010 Pacific Street. These two sites are separated by only one block, located on either side of Class and Avenue within the M11 district that Community Board 8 has been studying for many years. And I see members of Community Board 8 here today. The Community Board's M Crown Planning Initiative calls for rezoning to create a dynamic new mixed-use neighborhood with both housing and significant new commercial development, including space for a wide variety of economic sectors such as industrial, arts, and community facilities. The Department of City Planning has been working together with Community Board 8, the Brooklyn Borough President, and my office to advance a mixed-use planning framework for the area that would accomplish these goals. And I certainly applaud Community Board 8 for having the foresight and the vision to proactively plan for how they see their community shaping and moving forward in a responsible way that includes all the many facets of what real responsible development should look like when it is community-led. Since a city-led rezoning takes numerous years, it is not unreasonable that these two private applicants want to move faster and are now here before us with proposals. However, these proposals will help set the precedent for the wide area, so we must ensure that they are consistent with the vision of the community plan. And so I would say this has been almost four years in the making of these conversations in order to build and create within a community with two plans moving very separately, but I'm so pleased that we were able to negotiate to have them moving collectively together. For that reason, I agree with the City Planning Commission's modification of 1010 Pacific to an R7A to match the proposed density at 1050 Pacific Street. The originally proposed R7D zoning would have set too tall and dense a precedent for residential development on a mid-block street, and if applied to the whole area, would have left no room for the mixed-use, light industrial, arts, and community facility elements that the community has sought. I look forward to hearing from the applicants on how they believe their proposals will meet these goals, and from my constituents that are here today, and on the public on these important developments for the future of Crown Heights. And I just want to thank everyone that is here for these two proposals. I know that it has been years of negotiations, uh, long meetings, late night, 
phone calls, conference calls, sidebar calls, hallway calls, but we have actually made something really significant and impactful happen here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. I also want to acknowledge that uh, we were joined by uh, Council Member Reynoso. Um, I'd like to now call up uh, Richard Lobel, uh, Fayan uh, Benton, and Paul Jensen. Yeah. We have Paul. Swear okay, great. Yeah. Council, if you could swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Richard Lobel, I do. Van Baton, I do. Thank you. Chair, thank you for having us here. Majority Leader, thank you for your kind comments. This has indeed been the culmination of many efforts, uh, sidebar conversations and phone calls, and we're happy to, to be here as well. Once again, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC, uh, and I'm with Fan Baton of my office, and we're here for the 1050 Pacific Street rezoning. So the rezoning area, as you can see circled, is currently in an M11 district. And in 2013, uh, many blocks to the south and southeast, roughly 17 or 18 blocks, were rezoned to a combination of residential districts, including R7A. And this was done in, in essence to effectuate additional housing in the area. And so at the time, the M1 sites were also contemplated for rezoning, but because the uh, city wanted to operate on an, in an ex expedited manner, they were removed from the rezoning. So the consideration at the time was that they would be rezoned, but that indeed there would be a, a larger plan for going forward with those sites. And so now we find ourselves here with these M11 sites, and you can see in the circled area on Pacific Street west of Classen that you've got uh, these M11 sites adjacent to residential districts to the south. So you uh, take a look at this uh, zoning map for 1050 Pacific, it's highlighted in red, and the rezoning area, the entire area, uh, incorporates 10 lots and parts of two lots. So these lots are along Classen, the rezoning area extends from a boundary of about 225 feet east of Classen between, between Pacific and Dean Streets, and the proposed rezoning, if approved, would rezone the properties from M11 to an MX district, MX20, which is an R7A with an M14 uh, uh, mixed-use de designation. You can see from this uh, land use map that much of the lot area here included within the rezoning area is vacant or underutilized with one to two story manufacturing and industrial type buildings. The property itself, which is the largest property within the rezoning area and it, uh, accounts for roughly 24,000 square feet, is uh, currently used for parking. It is um, essentially a vacant open use, which uh, is the subject of the rezoning today. And you can see the zoning change map showing prior to the rezoning, the designation as M11, and then after the rezoning, the MX M14R7A designation. These are some site photos which demonstrate the uh, activity in the area. As you can see, again, as stated, there's kind of low-lying buildings here. Uh, there's the opportunity really here to develop what would be a valuable mixed-use use for the community uh, with ground floor commercial and residential above, and we'll page through to the uh, proposed plans. Just an eagle eye view of some of the larger buildings in the area, uh, which range from four and five story to 13 story buildings, being within roughly 600 feet of the property. So this is a site plan which demonstrates the layout of the building. Uh, the building would have two residential, uh, residential buildings on Pacific and Dean fronting both avenues and streets, as well as an interior courtyard. The ground floor would be largely commercial, so there's roughly 16,000 square feet of commercial use on the ground floor, of which a percentage would be light manufacturing in accordance with the M Crown uh, designation and, and uh, study that's been conducted by the community. The primary benefit of this to the area, there's actually several. One of them is this luscious interior courtyard. This would be a landscaped green area in between these two buildings. So while you have the two residential buildings on the sides, the central area would serve as an amenity to building tenants, to local residents, and was seen as something as we made our way through the community process that was really a, a huge benefit to the area. It's somewhere where you'd be able to go and have a cup of coffee, to spend some time outside, 
uh, and this is again open to everybody. Um, the two residential spaces would, uh, as you can see in the, uh, in the section, would rise on both sides of the development. Interestingly, the ground floor would be a through ground floor with the exception of the open area. There's a corridor connecting both ground floor commercial spaces. And again, one of the benefits of this building would be that these commercial spaces are intended to be smaller commercial spaces. The developers here and the architect made a distinct uh, effort to try to create local retail in this area. So they're essentially spaces which are made to be subdivided to allow for local businesses to occupy the space. Uh, again, one more uh, elevation to demonstrate that this would uh, rise to uh, a level of eight stories on both Pacific and Dean Street. The breakdown would be 103 units, of which uh, 33 units would be affordable. I know that there's been much discuss discussion around the affordability and the, um, with the council's and the majority leader's approval, the applicant has requested that option one and option two be mapped, but that the development proceed on option two. The basis for that is that this is somewhat of a unique building in that the applicant is offering two bedroom apartments for every unit in the building. So many times when we select option one, in fact, in my memory, for all the applications we've done with option one, there's a, 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 a mix of studios ones and twos that are included in the project. That's not this. This is basically a project which offers entirely 103 two-bedroom apartments so that uh, the, between the market rate and the affordable units, everything is seamless. Uh, it's intended really as a, to be a contributing building to the area, not only in terms of this, uh, this, this unit mix, which offers these generous sizes for small families and, and removes studios and ones, but also in terms of the local retail, which is gonna be able to locate in some of these smaller spaces, some as little as 1,500 square feet. The uh, central amenity being the courtyard, which can be used by the entire area. Uh, and you know, generally, we think that the building, the aesthetic of the building, one which we discussed with the majority leader, we think is, is relatively attractive and will contribute to this area. Um, so the remainder of the um, uh, Diagrams that de demonstrate a rendering of the building and proposed rendering of the building, and that's essentially the application. We'd be happy to answer any specific question. Thank you. I just wanted to turn it over to Council Member um, uh, Majority Leader Combo for questions. Can you describe for me again the bedroom mix? Sure. Um, uh, it's straightforward, which is that. Uh, there are 103 proposed units in the building. All of them are two bedroom units. Can you state that for me again? Yes. Uh, and I'll, uh, You can just state it again. No, sure. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I mean, it's for me, as, a land, as land use council, it's something which is, is a, a very thoughtful type of, uh, of consideration that was given. So 103 units, all 103 units as two bedroom units. And for all 103 uh, units, they will all be two bedrooms. That's correct. That is not contingent upon anything. No. If the financing doesn't work out, what will you be building? 103 units of two bedroom apartments. Okay. I, you know, it's it's that um, it's that when we came to the community board with this, and and again, I'm, I'm, and I know that um, that uh, Mr. Viconi and and uh, Ms. Tyus are here to discuss the community board's viewpoint. But when we came to the community board on this. Obviously, some of the history of the M Crown uh, study area has been discussed. There are these applications which have been around for over three years. And so there was an, a, a process, an iterative process, where we basically um, came to this point and understanding that the community board may be, have certain feelings with regards to uses and such. This is the building we came up with, and this building offers this package of units, commercial space, and open, and open space amenities. And so one of the items which has been part of the project since the first day has been the uh, 103 two units. We're happy to see this. We feel it's a unique offering to the community and we're excited to, to build it. Can you talk to me a bit how this project complements or uh, works in collaboration with the M Crown vision? Sure, so um, the M Crown vision discusses um, you know, when, when the M Crown proposal first came out a number of years ago, they talked about several things. Two of the primary things were the creation of good jobs 
and, the, and providing affordable housing units. And the 2013 Crown Heights rezoning actually preceded mandatory inclusionary housing. So this proposal is one of the first applications to come through within Community Board 8, uh, you know, f which provides mandatory inclusionary housing. So number one is that we, we are able to provide affordable units, um, which is one of the goals, stated goals of the M Crown study and the, and the M Crown resolutions, the first ones that were passed years ago. And then the second thing is with regards to commercial use. And we've got 16,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. 25% of that, or roughly 4,000 square feet, would be for dedicated M Crown uses as have been detailed by, uh, by Community Board Aid in their M Crown study. And so while uh, we've come to this, you know, to, the, to the final um, negotiation and to the final point in this long process, we're happy to basically be one of these pilot applications to come through and to say, we're gonna make this building work. Here is your building with affordable units with a favorable bedroom mix, a very favorable bedroom mix, probably the most favorable of any we've seen in the office, but also to not only to provide light manufacturing, which is a huge concern of the community board, but also as with a nod to local, re to local retail because this is not, uh, the space you can see as it's cut out is not one which, uh, I'm just gonna page back to it, you can see from the corridor area, this is not one where you're contemplating a big box, where you're contemplating a huge contiguous commercial space. While, while we have committed to a percentage for light manufacturing, we're, we've, we're also committing through this layout to basically local retail, smaller retail, people who can come in, have businesses in the area, want space like this, and really are gonna be able to create a community within this building itself. The small businesses will have openings onto the central courtyard area. There's gonna be a liveliness to the fact that people will be intermingling and be able to go and get their, uh, maybe get something to eat, uh, maybe get a cup of coffee, come into this middle courtyard area to really kind of create community here. I think that the community board recognized that when we had our meetings with them, and I think that that's one of the reasons, conditionally, that they chose to approve this application. I just want you to be mindful with the retail, and we'll be working with you as far as uh, with commercial rents that have skyrocketed all across the city, that many uh, local businesses have felt the challenges of remaining um, in business. So uh, moving forward, definitely wanna have conversations with you and identifying some of those businesses that have been what we call landmark institutions um, in our districts that are looking for affordable homes within their community. We would be thrilled to engage your office in that conversation. Okay, wanted to talk with you a bit about um, good jobs for building service workers. Can you talk about your plan for building service workers following the completion of this project? I know that representatives of 32BJ are in the room today, so uh, without offering any comments uh, on their behalf, I would say that the um, development team and the applicant has reached an arrangement with them such that um, that I think 32 BJ is in support of the application so in addition to the fact that we're happy that these local retail businesses will likely attract local tenants and local workers we know that 32 BJ has reached agreement with the applicant and, and we're excited to move forward in that regard as well architecturally the original plan that was presented were two uh different design buildings on both sides of the street. How did you address that issue? Um, uh, in all candor, uh, Majority Leader, we, I think we feel that after discussions with your office, this facade was actually um, somewhat more stylized and, and was, uh, seemed to offer more to the community. So my understanding is that the applicant was, was, is able to incorporate this facade onto both frontages. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, and, and uh, I can confirm that in writing to the council. Okay. Um, talking about uh, local hiring, what is going to be your local hiring and MWBE plan? Um, the, the applicant here is actually uh, a, a, an experienced developer in the area, so I know that they've, uh, ex they have a, typically have a preference for local hiring as far as MBWE, but basically they've said that they can continue to work on that and would be committed to, um, to attempting to offer a percentage of, of jobs to MBWE. I know that they have a good history on that. We talked to them about that before, and they said that that would not present an issue to them. So 
that sounds good. Okay. That we're having conversations and we're talking, but conversations and talking don't often yield results. Sure. So we need to have a plan okay. for your local hiring, and we need to have a further and deeper understanding of what your plan is going to be. Because it's been our uh, understanding that when these conversations are had and they're loose and we're not intentional about goals and deliverables, um, at the end of the year we have to report some abysmal uh, numbers as far as what MWBE participation has been across the city. I think that's another item which we would put on the list of items to finally uh, to address with, with your office. Um, sustainability and resiliency. Um, what sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction? So I'm looking for my slide here. So in addition to, um, to the available open space, was in, which is intended to be green open space uh, and the center of the building, as well as landscape, there's trees which are plotted on the diagram. These are intended to, um, to actually be fulfilled in, uh, with regards to the project development. My understanding is that um, there will be additional measures as, such as a green roof on this building. Um, but I think what I prefer to do is to incorporate that into the materials that we um, to we forward to your office as well uh, prior to the subcommittee's vote. Okay. Earth Day is coming up. I, oh, we're, we're well aware And this of that. council is very committed uh, to making sure that moving forward that our buildings are green, that they're sustainable, that they're resilient, um, and that they are actually improving the conditions in the environment by the way we do construction and building. And we're, we're also aware uh, not only of, of the council and your office, but also of the Brooklyn Borough President's Office, which has a, 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 a huge background in requesting sustainability measures and in enforcing those. So we're, again, happy to discuss that. Thank you, and I'm glad that you're aware and you're having conversations, but we're going to need all of this in writing. You got it. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over back to Chair Moya um, and my Thank colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public? Oh, we have one more. I'm sorry. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. I now call up um, Marius uh, Dutzik. Is that correctly? Just uh, press the button to make sure that the microphone is on and state your name and then you can begin. Uh, my name is uh, Mariusz Dujets. Good morning, um, Chair Moya and the members of the subcommittee. Um, yeah, um, like I said, my name is Mariusz Dujets. I'm a uh, custodian at the Empire, Stale, Empire Stable and I have been a member of 32BJ for uh, five years now. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of my union to share our support for the devel development at 1050 Pacific. Uh, as you have heard, 32BJ believes that a key element to creating a more fair, sustainable New York economy and good property service jobs that pay family sustaining wages and workers access to mobility and security. Uh, the potential jobs uh, created by this project will be filled by local members of the community and should help uplift working families. Um, the developers of 1050 Pacific have made a credible commitment that the future building service workers at this site will be paid the prevailing wage. We see this as an act of responsible development and we, have, and we hope that this project will serve as an example for other de developers in the area to follow, including the team developing at the nearby 1010 Pacific site that is also up for hearing today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to call up the uh, next panelist, uh, Gib Nicconi. Vaconi. Vaconi. Okay, sorry. Vaconi. And Ethel Tyus. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. My name is Gib Vaconi. Uh, I am a member of Community Board A, and for the last 
um, five years have been facilitating uh, some of the community discussions around the rezoning in the area that's referred to as the M Crown District. Um, I want to make sure for the benefit of the subcommittee members that um, it's clear that what Community Board 8 is doing here is very unusual for a community board in Brooklyn today, and that is requesting a residential upzoning. Um, that's not typical. Uh, I'm sure those members from Brooklyn understand that that's not typical today. Uh, the reason the community board is doing that is because we look at the M Crown District as a place that has a lot of development potential, and in that potential there's an opportunity to solve some problems that are um, important problems for our community district. And one of them is affordable housing, but the other one is accessible jobs that pay a wage that a family in New York City can live on. Um, so the community board has, has put together a plan uh, with a tremendous amount of assistance from uh, subject matter experts in development and real estate and affordable housing uh, to try to accomplish that vision within the M Crown Zone. And we're very grateful for the support of Majority Leader Cumbo in that process and appreciate her comments at the beginning of, the, uh, of this hearing. Um, so this is why it's very important to us that the private applications that are up for review today um, support the community vision for the M Crown District and don't compete with it in a way that will make that vision more difficult to execute. Uh, again, the key pieces of that vision are affordable housing and jobs, and so I want to speak to the affordable housing piece first in the case of 1050 Pacific. Um, uh, the community board voted conditional support for this project on the basis of the project electing MIH option one. It's very important for our community district that affordable housing created in community district eight be as close to the level of median income in district eight as possible. Uh, it's very important that opportunities for people who live in the district to remain in the district in the face of the housing pressure that's felt there now um, be extended. Um, I, I think it's great to hear that 1050 Pacific is going to include two bedroom apartments. It's, uh, families are probably under the most housing pressure of all in our district. And um, for that reason, I think it's important that this project move forward with MIH option one. I think accessible apartments that are family sized are an extremely short supply in our district. And uh, it was the community board's understanding at the time that it held its hearing on this item that the developer was interested in proceeding in that way. So we hope that that is where this project ends up. Uh, with respect to jobs, I'd like to comment for a second on the CPC's uh, final report on this item, which cited um, a report it issued in November as evidence that the community desire for requirements for manufacturing space were unfeasible. Um, that's not the view of the community board, and um, I'd like to point out that that report cited in the CPC report was based on um, uh, more than three times the square footage for light manufacturing area that the community board is asking for. It was based on a land cost more than twice what is being paid for the more expensive of these two applications, 1010 Pacific, and it's based on a 15% return for the developer. Um, what that does effectively, if you put those standards behind rezoning, is it eliminates the ability for the community to recapture any value for uh, jobs. Uh, and um, if moving forward, we take the position as a city that the developers and private owners need to profit handsomely from these rezonings to the exclusion of the communities being able to uh, accomplish any value recapture at all, um, I don't think many community boards are going to do what Community Board 8 has done in this circumstance. I don't think there's any incentives for the years of effort that have gone into this if we're simply told by the Department of City Planning that developers just need to make more money. So um, it's important to, to point out, I think, that this project, 1050 Pacific, demonstrates that the community vision for um, non-residential use, including light manufacturing, is commercially viable. Um, this project does not precisely mirror the M Crown proposal, but it is substantially close to it, especially when one considers uh, the square area on the first floor that's going to be used for the atrium and hence will not generate any income. Um, so um, uh, in closing, um, I would like to uh, again just return to the subject of jobs. Um, 
we're delighted that the developer has uh, agreed to commit to a percentage of use for the light manufacturing uses that the community board has defined as part of the M-Crown vision. And I personally would hope that that makes it into some binding commitments with respect to this project if it moves forward from here. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this application. Thank you, Mr. Bacconi. My name is Ethel Pius. I am the uh, chair of the Land Use Committee for Community Board 8. And Mr. Bacconi and I have worked together over the past several years to try to bring this project to fruition. And one of the things that we are seeing is that city agencies like DCP and uh, CPC tend to downgrade and uh, ignore recommendations coming from the community boards. And what we want them to do here also includes, in addition to the points that Mr. Bacconi addressed, is to limit this rezoning to the property owned by the applicants. And to keep in mind that because the AMI is set at a bird's eye view, it generally doesn't trickle down to true economic benefits on a local level in the community district that we are concerned with here. So those are two things that I would definitely ask you to add, that it not include the additional buildings that uh, are referenced in the uh, plan that the applicant has before you now, but be limited to the property that the applicant owns. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to thank both of you for your uh, incredible and tireless work. And I feel that I've done a, an amazing job because everyone is walking away somewhat disappointed. <laughs> so I, I, I respect your concerns about MIH option one. Um, and this was a very difficult decision. As a, as a new mom and so many of my friends and colleagues, and myself included, uh, with new families are living in studios and one-bedroom apartments. And so the ability to actually have a family and to have a two-bedroom apartment is like, in Brooklyn terms, a mansion. So it's really an opportunity to give families an opportunity to um, have some space, the ability to be able to raise a family in Brooklyn, New York, which is so increasingly difficult. But at the same time, those apartments are so few in number. This is actually the first project that will be entirely two bedrooms that I've ever approved. And the other challenge that we do face is that we certainly want to create a city where our teachers, our postal workers, our firefighters, our security, our maintenance, that the people that live in the communities are actually able to, once they've gone to Medgar Evers College and they've lived and grown up in the community and now they're a teacher or now they're a nurse, we want that uh, community to be able to live where they work as well. So this was certainly a, a difficult decision, um, but one that I feel takes into account a bit of what everyone has been talking about. So we certainly don't want to lose that workforce. Um, so many people are, uh, coming in from Pennsylvania and the Poconos and other areas to commute back and forth um, in order to live where they work. And with issues pressing upon us like congestion pricing and those sorts of things, that's also going to make some of that even more difficult moving forward. So the plan that you've created in Community Board 8 in terms of the ability to live where you work, um, the ability to walk where you work, to be able to have the services that you need in your community. And as Brooklyn, I grew up knowing Brooklyn is very much seen as, was seen as the bedroom uh, to Manhattan. So it was like Manhattan was where, where everything was happening and Brooklyn is where you slept. But now we're seeing a strong change in that. So I certainly respect the work that all of you have done um, and look forward to continuing with developing um, the vision of M Crown. Thank you. Thank you both. Madam Chair, I'd like to also add that those statements pertain to a recommendation from Crown Heights North Association as well. And um, all of the members of the committee should have letters from both Community Board 8 and the Crown Heights North Association in their email as I speak. Thank you. Always thorough.
Chair Moya had to step away to another committee. He will be back shortly. But are there any other members of the public who wish to testify today on 1050 Pacific Street? Okay. Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. And we are now going to pause for a few moments until our next hearings begin. So everyone can talk amongst themselves. Thank you. Okay, uh, if, anybody, if everybody can just uh, please take a seat. If everyone can take their seats, please. Uh, we are gonna start with a vote on several applications uh, we have previously heard. Uh, today we will vote to approve uh, LU's 369 uh, for the McDonald Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. The proposed zoning map amendments would map a new uh, C24 commercial overlay district within the existing R5 district to facilitate the continued operation of a commercial banquet facility located within the connected uh, cellar levels uh, spaces for two adjacent school buildings. Uh, this is in Council Member Lander's uh, district who is in support of this application. Uh, we will also vote to approve LUs 373, 374, 375 uh, for the Bondell Commons rezoning in the Bronx. The proposed uh, action would rezone an existing M11 district to an R7A C24 district, uh, map the, the project area as mandatory inclusionary uh, housing area utilizing option one and two, uh, and demap a portion of uh, Fink Avenue between Bondell Avenue and Waters Avenue. Uh, together, these actions would facilitate the development of a mixed-use building, uh, which the applicant has agreed will be six stories in height, with a seven-story uh, that is set back and expected to be developed under the ELLA term sheet. Uh, it will also include community facility space and 225 uh, accessory parking spaces. Council Member Jonai is in support of this application. Uh, we will also vote on LUs 382 and 385 for the Bruckner Boulevard rezoning in the Bronx. Uh, the proposal uh, includes a zoning map uh, amendment to rezone an R5 district to an R7A district and an R7A C24 district, a zoning text amendment to map the site, a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and uh, an article uh, uh, seven, an article uh, 11 tax e exemption for the uh, proposed uh, new buildings. Together, these uh, actions would facilitate the development of two new buildings, including 65 affordable home ownership units, 265 rental units, retail space, and 158 parking spaces. Uh, this is in Council Member Diaz, uh, is district, and he is in support of this application. Uh, we will also vote. Uh, to approve with modifications, pre-considered LUs 379, 380, and uh, for the uh, 1640 Flatbush Avenue rezoning uh, for property in Council District 45 in Brooklyn. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone the development site from a C uh, from a uh, C82 to an R6 district to a C44 D district and other portions of the rezoning area from a C82 district to an R6 district. Uh, a related zoning text amendment application seeks to establish the proposed C4 uh, to 4D district as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options uh, option two. Uh, 
uh, as proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 13-story mixed-use building, including retail use on the ground and second floors, and approximately 114 total dwelling units, including 34 affordable units and 40 below-grade accessory parking spaces. Our modification will be to remove MIH option two and add MIH option one in accordance with feedback from com the community board, uh, borough president, and a former council member. Uh, this application is in District 45, and the community board and the borough president have both indicated their support. Uh, I understand that the council member would like to see the project uh, with additional affordability beyond the required, uh, the, beyond what's required uh, by MIH. Uh, the challenge here is that this is not a project using uh, housing subsidy dollars, uh, so the council is modifying the proposal uh, to ensure depth of affordability for the affordable housing that is being provided. Uh, I now call a vote to approve LUs uh, 369, 373, 374, and 375 and 382 through uh, 385, uh, and to approve with modifications, I have described LUs uh, 379 and 380. Um, and so now, Council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Constantinidis. Uh, aye. I would now like to turn it over to uh, public advocate uh, Jamani Williams uh, for comments. I just want to remind everyone we are on a two-minute clock, so uh, let's try to keep our comments to two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you uh, to, to my uh, colleagues. Uh, this is uh, actually happened to be my, my first rezoning and, and the last at the, at the same time. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who was involved, <clears throat> including the community board and the ball president. Uh, I've had reason to be busy the past few months, uh, but uh, I, there was, seems to have been some miscommunication on, on, a, on a bunch of levels, uh, and in, in the, the communication meant to be that option one was the floor, and there would be continued uh, conversation uh, as to what we'd actually get to, and it wasn't until recently that I realized we actually remained at the floor, so I am sorry that, that occurred. Uh, I believe uh, SL acted in, in good faith. Uh, more holistically, I think uh, I've always made clear that I think MIH is a failed policy, and I'd like this opportunity again to ask this, com this uh, council to look at this zoning proposal because it is not enough. Um, this applicant chose not to use uh, HPD subsidy because there wasn't enough there. Um, it's not that we're getting 35 affordable units, in my opinion. It's that we're building 70 market rate. And what that does is allow continued gentrification. So it's good for those 35 families, but those 70 new families are going to come in not from the community. They're going to come from outside. So as a whole, it doesn't benefit for the community. And I know what's going to happen there, but I have to be on the record as asking for this not to be voted now, uh, because I think it is harmful to the community as a whole, even as I believe uh, SL Green tried to do the right thing here. And so my hope is that this body would please look at MIH. It is a problem with or without subsidy. And I believe asking for additional height uh, is a subsidy that we are not considering in, in good form. So I appreciate the ability to uh, speak. And I even appreciate the ability of uh, Chair Moyer speaking on my behalf when I wasn't here, making sure that option one was included. And uh, thank you, uh, Rafael Espinal, I'm sorry, uh, Rafael Salamanca, the chair of land use, uh, for all he did to try to push this forward. And, and um, just wanted to make sure I was on the record for that, as well as the candidates who are uh, running to replace me in agreement with me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council, continue with the roll. Council Member Levin. I vote aye. Council Member Reynoso. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, uh, my, I want to talk technically. Uh, my issue is a district that is not represented and doesn't have a represented sitting um, uh, to be able to help make decisions uh, for it um, is a concerning issue that I have. Should other council members move on to other positions, um, who advocates for their neighborhood? Um, it's just not a clear. It's just not clear to me exactly who does that. Um, but with the information that I have um, and the support, I guess, going, coming from the local community and the borough president, um, I'm going to vote aye on this project. Council Member Richards. I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. I vote aye. 
Councilmember Gordenchik. Aye. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and uh, referred to the full land use committee. And we're going to keep the, the vote open uh, for a couple of members uh, that are going to come in in a few. Um, so now I want to continue with uh, our public hearings uh, for today. Uh, we are staying on uh, Pacific Street uh, in Majority Leader Cumbo's district. Uh, the hearing today is on LU's uh, 393, 394 for the 1010 Pacific rezoning. Uh, this application, this applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing M11 district to an uh, R7D C24 district and a related zoning text amendment to map the site within a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option uh, one and option two. As proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 11-story mixed-use residential commercial building with approximately 154 units, approximately 7,000 square feet of ground floor commercial use and approximately 4,400 square feet of ground floor community facility use and 42 below uh, grade accessory parking spaces. Uh, the application before us has been modified by uh, the City Planning Commission as part of the public review process. The Commission uh, has modified the application from a proposed uh, R7D C24 district to an R7A C24 district. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and wanted to turn it over to Majority Leader D uh, Cumbo for uh, some remarks. My opening remarks uh, was intended for both projects. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, now we are calling up Richard Lobel, uh, Bayan uh, Benton, and uh, Dominic Recchia. Uh, good to see you, former council member Dominic Recchia, who's here today, and Jay uh, Valigar. Uh, council, please uh, swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Please state your name uh, as part of your response. Richard Lobel, I do. Bayan Baton, I do. Jay Valgora, I do. Jay Valgora, I do. Dominic M. Reckie, Jr., I do. Thank you. you. May begin. Thank you, Chair, Council Members, Majority Leader Cumbo, hi. Um, we're here for the 1010 Pacific Street rezoning. Uh, obviously, as the Majority Leader has done, we will um, limit our comments to general comments about the application, leaving behind some of the background of this area and the zoning. Uh, we would note, of course, that we are within the same M11 area. The block frontage and the entirety of the block here west of Classen offers something of a different nature than the block to the east. The majority of the lots on this block are vacant. And so when we entered into this process, this was a block where we were indeed able to provide more of an imprint. There was really no fixed character of this block, and so the idea was, you know, what were we going to do here? And so, uh, as you can see, the zoning district indicated here is a mixed-use R7A C24 district. As a matter of public record, this was entered into as an R7D C24 application. We went, wove our way through the public community board, Brooklyn Borough President, and city planning hearings, after which the city planning commission deemed it appropriate to reduce the R7D to an R7A. Um, I'd say just briefly by way of background, this has been uh, a challenge for us. Um, I think the majority leader is well aware that um, of the multiple conversations, many conversations we've, we've had on this, there was an attempt to reach somewhat of an understanding, not only with regards to this rezoning and this block, but this project. There was um, a, an opportunity to retain some of the existing building frontage at the site, to provide more community amenities at the site. The building would have been larger uh, and offered more units. At the end of the day, we're right now with an R7A. We're still um, saddened by that, but we understand that this is a process, a public process, and we need to move forward. And so we have the R7A here. The R7A extends 440 feet from Classen, covering roughly 48,000 square feet of lot area. The property itself is roughly 25,000 square feet and is highlighted in the red border on the tax map. 
And as you can see from the land use map, and as stated, the majority of the uses on this block are, you can see the grayed out uses are open uses, vacant uses. There are vacant sites on this lot. We're on this block, we're very happy to basically be moving forward with a development plan to bring something uh, to the area that will benefit the community. So this is the zoning change map. On the left, you can see an existing M11, and on the right, uh, an R7A with a C24 overlay. Again, there are uh, project photographs. You can see mostly low-lying uh, to vacant sites on the project block, as well as um, larger sites both uh, uh, within the area and also around the area. There's a map showing an eagle eye view, which demonstrates that there are some larger buildings in the area. And so right now, we've gone from what was formerly an 11-story building, which retained elements of the existing structures, to this building, which is nine stories, uh, rising to a height of roughly 90 to 95 feet. Uh, and you can see here the site plan, which demonstrates the centerpiece of the building as a nine-story mixed-use building, as well as, as was stated by the chair, of the, uh, chair Moya, certain community facility and commercial space on the ground floor. Here's the building uh, in elevation form. And we demonstrate the uh, residential and commercial breakdown of the building. As you can see, the total square footage of the building has now been reduced from roughly 148,000 square feet to 118,000 square feet of residential, which will consist of uh, approximately 129 dwelling units. Uh, and there are additional plans which demonstrate the layout of the sites, the uh, areas where parking and bike storage would take place. And this is uh, a, a, a relief map demonstrating an eagle eye view of la other large buildings in the area. At nine stories, obviously, or even larger, but definitely at nine stories, the proposed building, which is highlighted in red, the site's highlighted in red to the upper left portion, uh, can be seen to be well within the context of the surrounding area, judging from the five to six block radius of the site. Uh, we have additional materials which basically discuss certain maps and, and uh, backgrounds of the building area. I would note, um, just going back to the, to the building in relief, that the um, project does indeed contemplate option one. So of the 129 units, 25% or roughly 35 units would be affordable at option one, which of course is at AMIs uh, averaging 60%. And so uh, that's really the uh, bulk of the conversation and we have the project team here and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, I'm gonna turn it over to council member, uh, majority leader uh, Kumbo. So this is the, what's being presented now is the current design. Correct. It looks way more exciting than the first one. Um, <laughs> than the first than the first plan that was presented. I know for Jay, if if energy could kill right now, I know how difficult this was. Um, the design that's that was originally presented, as I stated, was I would say architecturally very exciting and very innovative, and. As a result of the negotiations, I understand that many of those design elements had to come out. And I am deeply disappointed that they did have to come out. But focusing my questions to the architectural design team, Jay, is there any way that some elements of design could be brought back into this. I understand you had to do this quickly for today's presentation, and I understand because I'm also an artist, and I consider you an artist as an architect, and how seriously you take your design, and how seriously, and how long and hard you've worked on this. Is there a way to bring back any of those design elements to this project? Um, as an architect who's worked closely with you, uh, Majority Leader, and as someone who's worked very closely in Brooklyn in this community, I would welcome the chance, uh, there's very little time before the council vote, but I would welcome the opportunity to meet with you to see if it's possible to restore some of those elements because the original design I felt was based very much on input from the community and on the vision that you helped us evolve for a really unique building. So I would welcome the opportunity to meet with you to see if that's possible. I would certainly welcome that because the design of the borough as a whole is very important. Wanted to talk about um, uh, MIH option and the bedroom mix for what is the proposed bedroom uh, mix for this particular development? 
So as currently proposed, the building would yield 129 dwelling units. 32 of these would be inclusionary units. Uh, and the unit count would come out to roughly 28 studios, 61 one bedrooms, 34 two bedrooms, and six three bedrooms. So this complies with MIH requirements, um, but basically offers a, a, a range of units depending on, you know, addressing different demands within the local residential population. Are you proposing to partner with a local not-for-profit organization to be the administering agent uh, for the affordable housing portion? Yes, we are, and there's uh, three not-for-profits that we uh, reach out Impact, NHS Brooklyn, and Canva. We got, we requested from you. We submitted these to the borough president, just waiting to see he make sure they're okay with them, and then uh, any other elected to see, make sure everyone's okay with these three. We will sit down with them and talk to all three of them in great detail, but we do have the three that we will be talking to. We just wanna make sure all electors are satisfied and we got these recommendations from your office. You certainly um, are working with all qualified groups, so we, we would like to be uh, work in participation with you to figure out who will be the final organization to help yes, us support and any, that. Yes, and we welcome any advice, any direction from you and your office. As we talked about the M Crown uh, proposal, I think one of the disappointing aspects of this particular project is that um, much of what the framework and foundation of this project began with, uh, Mayor de Blasio's State of the City, where he talked about the desire to create affordable housing space for artists, for art studios, for art space, and unfortunately, uh, there have been no mechanisms or tools put in place to actually realize those larger goals or visions um, that we were all very excited about initially, and those visions and goals complemented much of the work um, of the M Crown space, uh, the M Crown rezoning. But wanted to, to see, um, similar to the architectural question, are there uh, ways or aspects that this proposal can still match some of our original goals or any of the goals uh, that M Crown has put forward for the rezoning of this area. We would have to speak to the client, but in the process of working through the design with your office, there are a couple of creative solutions we could come up with if the council would like to entertain them. So we can actually have that conversation offline because I know that a lot of this was decided on Sunday in terms of um, not going to the R7D and, and going to the R7A. Uh, will this development have good jobs for building service workers? Um, of course, uh, we, we we've have spoken to, I personally have spoken to 32BJ. I met with them once. We have a meeting today at four o'clock to uh, go further and sit down. They s sent me their agreement. Uh, we have our attorneys looking at it and we have a meeting with the developer today with 32BJ and uh, to try to resolve all these issues and come to an agreement. But we are, and we do believe in hiring local, good jobs, and MWBE. You know, uh, our developer has always hired MWBE in the past, and he looks forward to in the future, and we will be working with the community. And, and just to add to- You have a lot of follow-up, Mr. Levin. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> but um, I would just add to that, that um, this is a local development company, and uh, having talked to them about this subject, um, they have indicated that more than 50% of their employees actually are local and work in, and live in Brooklyn. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, from the time of the Brooklyn Borough President's Office, we've been engaged in this conversation, and they have assured me that the, the project um, structural engineer is an MBWE, so they're, they're invested in, in local hiring and MBWE hiring, and so I think we can like, complete that conversation. And your conversation today with uh, uh, 32BJ will be very important because we always want to ensure that we have good quality jobs for building service workers. So we just want to make sure and, and to press upon how important that is to the body. We hear you loud and clear, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Mr. Dominic M. Recchia, Jr. <laughs> so happy to have you all here. I don't have any further questions. If anyone else on the, on the panel has f further no, questions. That we're, we're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank you. your and testimony today. It feels good to be back home. Thank <laughs> you. It's, it's great to have you as former cultural chair and finance chair of the city council to have you back here. 
is exciting and you're certainly a legend in this and for me to be on this side and you to be on that side is something I could have never fathomed in my wildest imagination. So, no one's more disappointed that uh, city planning didn't want to agree with our first proposal. I know. The artist housing, <laughs> but there is a need in this city for artist housing. And certainly. Someday we could uh, start developing housing for the artist. Thank you. And if anyone shares your passion, you know it's me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want, uh, now call up the next panel, uh, Dan Marks, G. Carter Clark, and Ian uh, Ellenberg. You wanted to speak on this one? Thank you. If you can just uh, please state your name, and I just want to remind everyone that we are on a two-minute clock, uh, so please try to keep your comments within uh, two minutes. Thank you. Sure. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan Marks. Uh, I've been working and living in the surrounding area for the past seven years and work in real estate. I'm here to give my full support to this project. Uh, there's an immediate need for more residential units in the market, especially affordable units, which this project will provide. The idea that there's an oversupply of units coming to this market is not true. Uh, while there are a lot of units coming to market all over Brooklyn, and I speak, I speak with developers every single day uh, who have new units currently on the market, and they're being leased up at a very steady rate. There's been a significant slowdown in the number of development sites acquired over the past few years, and by the time this project comes online, I would expect most, if not all, the current supply in the market to have been absorbed by then. It's critical that when properties or neighborhoods go through a rezoning that as much density that makes sense is allowed to allow for the maximum number of both market and affordable units to help alleviate the housing pressures. Furthermore, this neighborhood has been speaking for years about a broader rezoning, which I support, but there's no timeline as to when it will be complete. I think it's important for projects like this not only to test the market, but prove to future developers that you can build a successful mixed-use project of scale in this part of the neighborhood. Look, for example, at the Lightstone project that was built in Gowanus years prior to the proposed rezoning. That project has been a tremendous success and has given confidence to developers waiting for the rezoning to happen. Once it happens, I expect development to start immediately. Thank you for your time and opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, Subcommittee Chair Amoya, thank you very much for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Carter Clark. I work for HSN, HSN Realty Corporation, who is a property owner, a uh, longtime property owner um, in this neighborhood. Um, for over 75 years and has been embedded in the community. Um, I'm, I have a letter that I've prepared to, to read off. Um, in, in, in response to 1010 Pacific Street LLC and 1050 Pacific LLC's applications, we support activating Pacific Street and applaud the proponent's commitment to the public accessible space and community art center on the ground floor. The introduction of new residents will help support new neighborhood services, promote, promote activity and job creation, and propel the much needed revitalization of this section of Crown Heights. We welcome sensitive, tasteful, and responsible development in our neighborhood. In 1010's case, saving part of the warehouse facade will help transition the architecture with its nod to the past. It appears that element's no longer um, included, but we support uh, continuing to consider that. We look forward to working with other stakeholders, the community board, the Department of City Planning and City Council to make sure this neighborhood reaches its full potential. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. My name is Ian Engberg. I am a longtime resident of downtown Brooklyn. I have owned a building that's right next to it. For Can you just speak a little bit uh, more into the microphone? Thank you. I've owned a building in that name on that block for the past 17 years currently rented it to myself as a woodworker, graduated from Pratt. I'm now in a position where, due to taxes and the increase in stuff, I need to move my business. I've been trying to rent out this space. It's been unable to because of the way the neighborhood looks right now. So I'm very much in favor of this 
to kind of save my property. And that's really. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, calling the last panel uh, on this uh, item, uh, Gib Vaconi, uh, Ethel Tyus, Jessica Ortiz, and Greg Todd. Just please uh, state your name, make sure that the uh, red light is on, that your microphone is on, and uh, please keep it to two minutes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Moya, Majority Leader Cumbo. Again, my name is Gib Vaconi. Uh, I'm a member of Community Board 8, and um, I'm going to um, I'm going to speak specifically on this project, although the comments I made about the background of the M Crown rezoning apply here as well. Um, in addition to uh, the reduction in density as, uh, as uh, stipulated by the CPC, um, it's also important that we limit the scope of this rezoning to the lot and the properties that are controlled by the applicants. There's a substantial number of additional properties that are in this um, rezoning uh, the boundary adjustment going all the way to Classen Avenue, and those are properties that will not be able to benefit from the M Crown rezoning if they're uh, allowed to move forward with the rest of this rezoning. The, the rezoning as specified here does, does not address um, the specific requirements for light industrial arts and community facilities uses that are part of the M Crown plan and that the community board would very much like to see um, incorporated in the rest of the neighborhood rezoning. I'd, I'd also like to say that I share the frustration of one of the last panelists who talked about the length of time this process has been taking. Um, in July of 2015, the head of the Brooklyn Office of City Planning uh, assured the community board that they were prepared to commit resources to move this along expeditiously. And unfortunately, the delay has resulted in a speculative bubble in this market, which does threaten the viability of some of the value recapture for affordable housing and jobs that the community board seeks. So I would like to, um, I'd like to encourage the committee to urge the Department of City Planning to please move forward with all alacrity to, on, this, on this plan so those opportunities uh, will continue to be viable. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jessica. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jessica Ortiz, and I am a building service worker at Trinity School and have been a member of SEIU 32BJ for six years. I'm here on behalf of my union and the 732 BJ members who live in District 35 to express our concerns regarding this rezoning. As you know, New York's economy is hard on working families, and we believe that in order to create a fairer New York, developers should commit to providing prevailing wage building service jobs. This is especially true when it comes to projects like this one proposed, a majority market rate development in an increasingly expensive community. The rezoning sought by the developer of 1010 Pacific is a potentially lucrative one that would convert manufacturing land to residential use. We believe that the gains of rezoning should be shared with working families and that developers should create good jobs that give workers dignity and security. Unfortunately, the developer seeking this rezoning, an affiliate of EM Equity Holdings, has not made a credible commitment to pay building service workers prevailing wages. We think working New Yorkers deserve better and, Bro and Brooklyn Community District 8 also deserves better. In the M Crown rezoning plan, the community board said we should maximize the potential for good jobs in this area. We hope that development team for this project will take meaningful steps to do so. We respectfully request that you urge the developer to commit to good jobs that pay prevailing wages for building service workers before you approve this project. Thank you. If, if we can just pause for one second, I just want to uh, uh, open up the vote. Uh, we have uh, Council Member Torres here. On a continuing vote on the land use items, Council Member Torres. I vote aye. Thank you. A vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. You can hear me? Good. My name again is Ethel Tyus, and good morning again to Council Member Cumbo, Majority Leader Cumbo, and Chair Moya. Uh, my name again is Ethel Tyus. I'm Chair of the Land Use Committee for Brooklyn Community Board 8, and we are here to help the committee 
help the applicants conform their proposals to the uh, uh, rezoning plan for the M Crown section of Brooklyn Community Board 8. They've made a substantial effort to do that by moving from R7D to R7A, and we greatly appreciate that. We're looking forward to um, city planning being more um, reactive to our proposal by separating, as Mr. Bacconi suggested, the additional lots near the applicant-owned site from this rezoning plan uh, so that those additional sites can participate in the M Crown rezoning, which the vision is walk to work. We want to have uh, as much um, permissible light manufacturing space in this area in addition to the north-south commercial corridors on the um, side residential streets as well. So we're looking for those opportunities where smaller uh, light manufacturing can occur and people, artists, can live and work, people can walk to work. We want that village feel and if we go with large residential buildings which will only employ a static number of, of staff going forward, period, there won't be any additional jobs in that area for our current residents. We'll continue to experience gentrification. So we hope that the uh, land, uh, the um, rezoning committee will help the applicants conform their uh, plans to both the uh, community board plan and with the support of the Crown Heights North Association, as again, you will have letters to this effect in your mailboxes. Thank you. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak, um, uh, Majority Leader Combo and uh, Chair Moyo. My name is Greg Todd. I'm a 20-year member of Community Board 8. I'm also a real estate broker with the Corcoran Group. I market the largest purely affordable co-op project in Crown Heights as an agent for the Corcoran Group. I also worked for 15 years as a nonprofit housing developer in the neighborhood. I've also been a strong supporter of retaining the manufacturing character of this neighborhood. And the reason it's manufacturing is because prior to the war, uh, Brooklyn was known not only for a residential neighborhood, as Ms. Combo pointed out, but also as a manufacturing neighborhood. And people lived and worked in the same neighborhood. Um, due to changes in infrastructure, now it's become fashionable to manufacture in China, um, elsewhere in the United States, not locally. I think we're entering a period of rapid change. The mere fact that a president named Trump is sitting in the White House now is something that points well to that fact. And I think there's a distinct possibility that a gentleman named Sanders might be in a few years. And all of that makes it extremely hard for a developer to try to figure out what the heck to do with this space. But I think that changes are in place now that are going to result in rising transportation costs, a decrease in the likelihood of materials coming in from China, and an increase of likelihood we're going to need to return to our roots of manufacturing in our neighborhoods and creating jobs for our citizens in the neighborhoods they work in. If we go forward and destroy these manufacturing zones and make them exclusively residential, when the future arrives, as it surely will, where we will need to begin to go back to the point of manufacturing our neighborhoods, there will not be space to do it. So I think we should stand back, take a longer look at the historical perspective, not just look at what we can build here and now, but what will it be like when the 30 years lapse, when these mortgages are due on these properties. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your testimony here today. I just want to thank all of you, and again, uh, part of the challenges that we had was with the uh, decrease from the R7D to the R7A. We lost a lot of the elements that would have complemented many of the goals of the um, M Crown District. So I'm hoping that moving forward, we're able to figure out more ways to be able to uh, work collaboratively so that we have uh, more uh, opportunities to complement the goals of the community that are still affordable to the community residents that live there as well. So there was a lot of uh, give and take, and as I stated earlier, um, everyone walks away somewhat disappointed. So, you know, this is the hard part about this job because there were so many aspects about the original plan um, 
that frankly I loved and I'm disappointed that they will not be a part of this project, but hoping um, in the aftermath we can figure out some ways to have many of those uh, winning components be brought back into the project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now moving on to our next public hearing. for. Uh, are there any other members uh, of the public that wish to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, uh, we now close uh, the uh, application and it will be laid over. Uh, our next public hearing for today is on LU's uh, 390 for the uh, 270 Park Avenue text amendment in Council Member uh, Powers' district in Manhattan. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning text amendment to the East Midtown subdistrict of the Special Midtown District to facilitate an open, uh, publicly accessible space on the development sites, uh, Madison Avenue frontage, and to modify other subdistrict uh, regulations in order to uh, in order to permit the open, publicly accessible space at this uh, alternative location. Uh, the request action would facilitate a new office building approximately seven stories tall and approximately 1.87 million square feet of floor area, including approximately 667,000 square feet of floor area transferred from Grand Central Terminal under a separate CPC chairperson certification, which was approved on December 14, uh, 2018. This application before us has been amended as originally proposed or proposed uh, to modify the text amendment in response to input received during the uh, public review process. The original proposal sought to allow a 7,000 square foot enclosed publicly accessible space on the site's Madison Avenue frontage in lieu of the 10,000 square foot open to the sky publicly accessible space across uh, the through block portion of the site as required by the subdistrict text. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I wanted to turn it over to Councilmember Powers uh, for his remarks. Thank you. Thank you to Chair Moya and to the members of the subcommittee today for hearing the text amendment for 270 Park Avenue that will create a new building for J.P. Morgan Chase in East Midtown in my district, the 4th Council District. In early 2018, J.P. Morgan announced they would take advantage of the East Midtown rezoning project passed in 2017 by the City Council and led by my predecessor, Dan Gorodnik, by rebuilding their headquarters at 270 Park Avenue. For the past year, I've been in discussion with J.P. Morgan, many of the folks who are here today, uh, as the first pro uh, 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 I've been in touch with them as the first project to take advantage of the East Midtown rezoning and as they've worked through their plans for a new headquarters in East Midtown. Throughout the process, we've been encouraged to see their commitment to investing in Midtown and consideration of feedback from the local community board, the borough president, and our own suggestions here at the city council on the creation of a new office tower to consolidate its New York City employees while providing public benefits that are intended under the uh, East Midtown rezoning and in the spirit of the East Midtown rezoning. In order to build a tower that allows for all of J.P. Morgan's employees and because of their unique placement of the building standing above Grand Central Terminal's train shed, they're seeking a text amendment on open space location and layout, retail space, and street wall continuity. Due to the train shed, the amendment originally proposed and uh, originally proposed creating an enclosed 7,000 square foot public space that was 3,000 square feet less than required in the East Midtown rezoning. That was the original proposal. Along with support from community members and the borough president, we've asked the applicant to reconsider building in a way that both supports the infrastructure of the train shed and provides the necessary open space required under the rezoning. I also urge them to consider additional transit improvements to the existing subway entrances adjacent to their proper property on 47th Street and to seek other ways in which their investment in East Midtown could support the new influx of employees who will work at the new headquarters when it opens. The revised amendment before us today exhibits a new plan to increase the open space from an enclosed 7,000 square feet to an open 10,000 square feet, which is something we requested and was uh, intended through the East Midtown rezoning. In addition, the applicant has also contributed $42 million to the public realm fund that is managed by the East Midtown Governing Group to make infrastructure improvements in the neighborhood, which is also part of the East Midtown rezoning. And recently, the MTA announced that the J.P. Morgan would also be investing in transit upgrades at Grand Central Terminal to improve the Metro North train shed as another contribution outside what is necessary under the East Midtown rezoning. 
These improvements include a $12 and $25 million investment to the shed, significant restoration to spaces impacted to the east side access project, and a new entrance on 48th Street and Madison Avenue. Today, we hope to learn more, I hope to learn more, about how they can expand upon those estimates in the MTA and how we can continue the conversation in the coming weeks as this comes before the Council for a full vote. I want to thank you to J.P. Morgan for being good partners in the conversations we've had over the past year and incorporating feedback from the community in their plans. And I look forward to the continuing the conversation as the project moves forward and appreciate their commitment to staying in East Midtown here in New York City. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member Powers. I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Chin. Um, I now want to uh, call up David uh, Karnavoski, uh, uh, Vishan uh, Charka Bardi. Did I say that correctly? Close enough. Close enough? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jeremy uh, Dorkin and uh, David Clooney. Yes. Correct? Uh, Council, can you please swear in the panel? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? And please state your full name as you respond. Uh, Jeremy Dworkin, I do. Devin Mayer, I do. David Cloney, I do. Vishan Chakrabarty, I do. David, Kar David Karnofsky, I do. I'm sorry. Uh, Dave David, you said? Devin Mayer. De did you fill out one of these? You may begin. Good morning, Chairman Moya, uh, Majority Leader Combo, members and staff of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm David Clooney, Head of State and Local Government Relations at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. I'm joined today by Devin Mayer, Project Manager for J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, David Karnofsky, our counsel from Freed Frank, Jeremy Dworkin from the architect for this project, Foster Partners, and Vishan Chakrabarty, uh, our design consultant from POW. My colleagues and I are pleased to appear before you today to discuss a proposed text amendment that would facilitate the, uh, the building of a world-class headquarters for J.P. Morgan Chase at 270 Park Avenue. J.P. Morgan Chase is one of New York City's largest private sector employers with a best-in-class workforce of more than 20,000 workers in the city, 5 million consumer customers, and 500,000 business customers that we serve in more than 350 branches across this great city. We're proud, of, we're proud to be a part of the fabric of New York City, our home for more than 200 years. New York City is special to us. It's not only the financial capital of the world. More importantly, it's our home, which has been a source of pride for our employees, clients, and customers since 1799. This project will build on the firm's strong legacy of investment in local communities in New York City. We are committed to developing a state-of-the-art building with world-class privately owned public space that the city's residents and visitors alike can enjoy. Like all of you, we're committed to advancing the key public policy goals of the East Midtown rezoning, namely the development of modern office space that will revitalize the city's most important central business district, the creation of impactful public realm improvements, and the continuing protection and maintenance of designated landmarks. To facilitate the redevelopment process, we have purchased approximately 666,000 square feet of transfer transferable uh, development rights from Grand Central Terminal. This transaction provided $10 million for the continuing maintenance of that landmark, as well as $42 million for public realm improvements that will be identified by the Public Realm Improvement Fund Governing Group. After demolition and construction are completed, our new building will provide a 21st century workspace with capacity for approximately 15,000 employees. Additionally, the new building will meet the highest standards of quality, sustainability, and design. It will serve our employees and our clients and the public and stand as a symbol of J.P. Morgan Chase's longstanding commitment to New York City. We plan to use union labor and we are actively working on executing a project labor agreement. I'll note that our swing space of approximately 1.5 million square feet where our employees will reside during construction was built with a project labor agreement using union labor. I speak for my colleagues at J.P. Morgan Chase when I say we are proud to be recommitting to East Midtown. We look forward to working with you both during this text amendment process and as the project proceeds. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. With that, I'll introduce my colleague, David Karnofsky. Uh, David Karnofsky, Freed Frank Land Use Council uh, to the project. Uh, we're here today to present a zoning text amendment that would adjust, adjust the requirements of the East Midtown regulations governing the provision of open space at 270 Park Avenue in order to facilitate J.P. Morgan Chase's new world headquarters building at that location while providing an attractive, high-quality public amenity consistent with the goals of the East Midtown rezoning. As you will hear more from Devon Mayer, the existing regulations, which would require a 10,000 square foot public space open to the sky across the middle of the block, 
present a number of practical difficulties. The difficulties are also presented by the fact that approximately 75% of the site sits over the Metro, Metro North train shed, with only 25% of the site at its western edge on solid ground. Chase originally submitted an application for a text amendment that would allow for a 7,000 square foot interior public space along the Madison Avenue frontage of the new building. The 7,000 square foot interior space had a number of positive features, but during the course of the review process at the community board and at the borough president, we heard loud and clear that the public space should remain open air and must have a size of 10,000 square, square feet. In response to these comments, the Chase team developed an alternative approach, which will result in a 10,000 square foot open space running along the full length of the Madison Avenue frontage and would be open air. We submitted an amended application to city planning in order to make this possible. The revised text amendment adheres closely to the Greater East Midtown rezoning while accommodating the challenges of building over and around the transportation infrastructure below and, the other, and working through the other site conditions. We think it will result in an attractive space that will be well used by the public and be fully consistent with what the city sought to accomplish in 2017 when it adopted the rezoning. I'm now going to turn to Devin Mayer, who will discuss the site, the proposal to relocate to Madison Avenue, and the features of the public space. Thank you, David, and good morning, Chairman Moya, members, and staff of the subcommittee. I am Devin Mayer from J.P. Morgan Chase, and we are grateful for the opportunity to appear in front of you today. I will spend the next few minutes providing an overview of our project and how the unique site location has caused us to approach the design of the mandatory open, publicly accessible space. Our site occupies a full block between Park Avenue and Madison Avenue and 47th and 48th Street. This image on the screen illustrates what the text as written tells us we need to do. Option one splits the building in half and option two creates compromised floor plates throughout the building that do not meet the needs of the J.P. Morgan Chase businesses that will occupy the space. The text as written does not allow for a pop space to be located along Madison Avenue or Park Avenue. The majority of our site sits above Grand, the Grand Central train shed and is illustrated by the white area on the slide. A small portion of our site sits on terra firma is an, and is highlighted in brown on the slide. As part of the design process, we evaluated the option two placement of the POPs as illustrated in green, and we were unable to make this placement work with the design of our building, which I will now explain. Given our location over the train shed, we have a complex series of structural transfers highlighted in red that occur in and around the ground floor and are required to support the new building design. The depth of the structural transfers are limited by the active railroad tracks below and require us to elevate portions of our ground floor slab, which should not allow us to create a compliant pop space. In addition to the structural transfers, our new building design places the elevator cores on the north and south side of the ground floor. The southern elevator core, highlighted in gray, creates a conflict with the POPs. Within the terra firma portion of our site, we have located truck elevators to access the below-grade loading dock, the associated service elevators, and all of the incoming building services, including electric, steam, gas, water, and telecommunications that serve the building. The location of these elements within the terra firma portion of our site were very limited <clears throat> and are pushed as far east as they can be without interfering with the adjacent train shed. All of these unique site conditions caused us to locate the POPs along, Madison, along the Madison Avenue frontage of the site. As David mentioned, we originally submitted an application for 7,000 square, square feet of interior space, which is illustrated in the image on the left. During the course of the, of the review process with, the, with Council Member Powers, Community Board 5, and the Borough President, we received strong feedback that caused us to revisit the design of the building, which allowed us to create a 10,000 square foot open air public space along Madison Avenue and a portion of 47th Street, which is illustrated in the image on the right. We believe that placing the POPs on Madison Avenue creates an opportunity for much needed relief <clears throat> and is particularly needed on our site because of the existing stairway, escalator, and elevator into the 47th Street cross passage that connects this part of Midtown with Grand Central Terminal. Furthermore, east side access will soon be complete and will also be accessed from the same vertical circulation. As a consequence, the Madison Avenue side of our site is a new gateway moment into our city and as such should provide pedestrian relief, 
a kind of natural foyer into the city in which the pedestrian encounters trees, water, light, and air before moving on to the city. Our reconfigured public space responds to sp specific comments received as part of the public review process and now includes 10,000 square feet of open air space on Madison Avenue and a portion of 47th Street that will be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, will include a, a cafe kiosk and will not have any permissible private events. These are photos of the existing building along Madison Avenue taken from the south on the left, <clears throat> from the south on the left and from the north on the right. From an urban design perspective, we feel that Madison Avenue is appropriate because as you can see from the photographs, the relentlessness of the Madison Avenue street wall has resulted in a dark corridor with little relief for the public. As you know, Madison Avenue was added to the original 1811 Commissioner's Grid as a retail avenue. While it is a renowned success, particularly further north, the avenue in Midtown is congested with narrow sidewalks and tall buildings. It is for this reason that we believe that the addition of a bright, spacious, well-designed, 10,000 square foot open air public space is appropriate in keeping with the feedback we have received through the public review process. This is a perspective of our, of our existing building from the southwest corner of 47th Street and Madison Avenue. And here you can see a rendering of what the proposed future plaza could look like. The building is pushed back from the street on all sides and gracefully slopes upwards to open up the plaza to the sky and allow for increased amounts of light and air to make its way down to the plaza. There is an opportunity to create a separation from the street and sidewalk through planting and with the integration of the kiosk, we can create different pockets of space that allow for relaxation and respite. All of these opportunities will be carefully studied and presented through the design certification process and will result in the creation of a world-class public space that will serve as a destination amenity for those who live and work in East Midtown. As David mentioned, the revised text allows for the relocation of the open space to Madison Avenue, a waiver of the Madison Avenue street wall and retail continuity requirements, and, adjust, and, and an adjustment to the POPS design regulations to accommodate the site constraints. This concludes our presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the subcommittee and Council Member Powers and his staff for their leadership and guidance through the public process. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of questions before I turn it over to Council Member Powers. Uh, you uh, may have talked about it, but can you just sort of give a brief overview of um, as to how the public review process uh, influenced the proposal uh, that we have uh, before us today? Um, as we mentioned earlier, we initiated the process with this appli an application for the 7,000 square foot interior uh, space. Um, and we uh, did that because we thought an interior space could be attractive, provide a year-round climate-controlled environment, um, and could be attractively designed. Um, we proceeded into the process. We went to the uh, community board, spoke with the borough president, of course, spoke uh, a number of times with the council member, and got very strong uh, feedback uh, regarding uh, what they felt was most consistent with the regulations as adopted in 2017 and what they wanted to see on the site. And that was really twofold. Um, one was that the space should be open air, not enclosed. Uh, and secondly, that we should achieve the 10,000 square foot uh, requirement under the regulations. Um, at that point, we uh, submitted an amended application to city planning with a reconfigured uh, open space that achieved those two uh, goals. Um, both applications, the original and the amended, were heard at city planning. The uh, original was withdrawn, the amended was approved, and that's why we're here today with a 10,000 square foot space open to the air. Great. Um, and are you aware of any other sites in the special district that might be uh, impacted uh, by this text amendment? Uh, no, the text amendment is uh, geared to uh, this site. Um, it allows for the movement of the space from the middle of the block in a situation that is unique to this site. Um, it has to do with the size of the site at 80,000 square feet and the presence of a um, rail mass transit entrance uh, outside the through block portion. Um, with those two criteria uh, in place as the eligibility requirements for movement of the space, this is the only block uh, in which it could apply. Great. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I now turn it over to Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, and thank you to the Chair for his questions. Um, can you talk about this is the first project to come out of the East Midtown rezoning, and obviously a very prominent one. Can you talk to us just um, simply about the options that you were considering and the decision to stay in East Midtown and take advantage of the rezoning versus other options that J.P. Morgan was considering? I know there was some conversation about moving maybe moving out or moving west, and, and was, was, was a decision to stay here and the in influencing factors towards or, uh, you know, around the East Midtown rezoning? So I'll, I'll begin and I'll let um, my colleagues follow up if necessary. So um, part of this was that we looked at a number of options uh, for you know, what would serve our purposes. Um, we wanted to stay in, in East Midtown. Um, we have an inefficient footprint currently across New York. We have 14 locations, um, five in Midtown alone, and there was nothing else in, uh, in Midtown or anywhere else in Midtown, that uh, Midtown East or otherwise, that would serve our purposes in one building. Um, right now in 270 Park Avenue, um, you have um, aging infrastructure. It was designed in the 1950s to house 3,500 people. We had over twice that capacity in it, um, and it has inefficient elevators, uh, electrical, um, restrooms otherwise, uh, as well as at 383 Madison Avenue. Uh, it's been over 20 years without any significant investment um, in, in that space, and that's office space and trading floors that, that are in significant need of, um, of improvement. For us, uh, a big part of it was um, our, our talent and uh, employee experience. This is a, uh, uh, a transportation hub. It's somewhere that's convenient for our clients, customers, and we also want to uh, continue to be uh, a, a positive impact on this neighborhood. We need a uh, 21st century modern space with um, open space, collaborative workspace, um, more efficient, you know, systems, and uh, so that was a, a big part of uh, of our decision making process. And really, this is a recommitment of J.P. Morgan Chase to New York City, and and now uh, we think envisioning. Um, the vision that was embodied in the Midtown East rezoning, which is um, modern office space, and we hope that it will be uh, a model for other developments. Thanks for that. Um, and can you talk about your options you considered in addition for this location, particularly around uh, obviously you're, you're taking down the existing building, and had you considered some other way to modify or renovate, and uh, what sort of led to the option to, to take down the building that's at 270 today? We did study uh, a modification to the building, full gut renovation. Um, you know, structurally, the building can't accommodate an overbuild, um, cannot accommodate an overbuild, and um, ultimately that was the reason why we chose to take, uh, remove the existing building and redevelop the site. Uh, as David mentioned, you know, the building today is designed, was designed for 3,500 people. We had, uh, until last Friday, over 6,500 employees uh, that worked out of that building. And uh, it, it was it had reached its limit from an, uh, from a capacity standpoint, and the infrastructure uh, simply could not uh, support it. Even if we were to strip everything out uh, and and start from scratch within that existing shell, uh, we simply could not uh, meet the needs of our business. Okay, thanks. Um, talking about air rights purchasing, which is a, which is a key component of the, the East Midtown rezoning. You, you mentioned uh, you buying air rights from Grand Central Terminal. Can you just restate the the, the number of air, the uh, square footage of air rights you bought and, and, and who you bought them from? Was there any other entity that you got, you received or purchased air rights from? Uh, the amount is 666,766, I believe. Um, uh, All from Grand rights. Central? Uh, all from Grand Central. That was, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, transferred pursuant to certification at the end of uh, last year for purposes and, of the building. Okay, thanks. And uh, and 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 just just clarifying here, it's the, the amount that went into the public realm fund for, through, that goes to the East Midtown Governor Group because that air purchase is forty-two million dollars. Slightly less than forty. Slightly million. less than forty-two million dollars. Uh, the, you're, you're seeking a waiver on retail space along Madison Avenue. Can you talk to us whether there'll be any retail incorporated into the site, even if it's not on Madison Avenue? So, so Madison Avenue um, has a um, street wall requirement for the location of the street wall in close proximity to the street line, as well as a retail continuity requirement. In order to um, build this space, uh, we're asking for a waiver of, of both of those requirements to permit the open air environment along the Madison Avenue frontage. Um, in addition, um, the POPs rules, which apply here um, by cross-reference, essentially, 
um, require um, that there be retail frontage along the building edge that you see in, in this um, il illustrative rendering. Um, but as um, we talked about earlier, the area um, adjacent to that facade is essentially taken up with the mechanical spaces and service spaces. This is the only terra firma uh, on the site, and we desperately need that space for those kinds of functions. Um, so rather than provide retail along that frontage, um, we have written the text, and city planning approved it in this form, to require uh, a kiosk in the space for some activation of the space. Um, so whereas in the normal situation a kiosk is an option, uh, here it is a requirement. And, that and, will and any, any other plan retail in the building beyond the kiosk? Uh, not on this frontage. We're studying locations for a branch bank um, as we have in the existing building today. We have not yet settled on where uh, that branch bank may be located. Okay. Um, and uh, in addition to the $42 million contribution to public realm, realm fund and the upgrades of 47th Street, can you just talk to us and elaborate a little more on your commitments to the MTA around the Metro North and any other commitments that you've made in terms of investing in public transportation to accommodate new density, new population, and consolidation? As you know, Council Member, we, we spent uh, many, many months uh, negotiating with the MTA to arrive at uh, a framework which we've recently agreed upon that will govern the work, uh, our work below 270 Park Avenue within the train shed and within the Eastside Access uh, project area. Um, as part of that framework, we have made commitments to uh, perform work on their behalf, uh, replacement of the viaduct adjacent to the building, and uh, helping to facilitate the entrance at 48th Street, as you mentioned in your opening remarks. Um, we are in daily discussions with them uh, to make sure that we can uh, coexist, that their project can continue uninterrupted, and that we can, uh, we can launch our project and uh, achieve the goals that we have as well. So we, we feel very good about where we are uh, in terms of progress made with the MTA and, uh, and, and look forward to continued success with them. And just, sorry, can you just enumerate what the public benefits will be here in terms of regulate the transit from the air rights to down to the recent commitments? Just can you put them in a... So as part of the air rights uh, purchase, there's $10 million that uh, will be uh, committed to uh, preserving the landmark uh, Grand Central Terminal. Um, the uh, improvement that will be made to the, uh, the train shed, as you mentioned, um, is the, the, the financial framework of that is still being worked out, as is the financial framework for uh, the 48th Street entrance. Um, in addition to that, we have the existing entrance on 47th Street that's on our site that will be improved as part of uh, our project. Those, those plans are still being developed. And then the, the money that was the contribution to the fund via transit as well. Um, okay. The, uh, just, just on Park Avenue, since we're talking about Madison Avenue here, have you considered any improvements on the Park Avenue side to public space, pedestrian space, or even there's been discussions around redoing the medians there to enliven them? Have you given any consideration to the Park Avenue side in ways that you can enliven that space as well? Council Member, the design team is looking at that. We intend to have a beautiful entrance on Park Avenue. We are looking at widening sidewalks where we can and so forth. Um, and so we are still in the middle of the design process for that. And when do you think you have a more concrete answer to that question? Then we want it. Yeah, I mean, what would you say, Jeremy? Yeah, well, no, no. So, uh, Council Member, we can certainly return to you and as we're developing the building. There's a lot of design work going on. That May, May 8th sounds like a good day to have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, um, talking about sidewalk space, part of this has you uh, uh, expanding the sidewalk space around the building. Is it, is it, two questions. One, is it mandatory under East Midtown rezoning or is that voluntary? And then can you tell us how much space you are adding into the sidewalk space to accommodate new pedestrians? The required sidewalk widening takes place along the Madison Avenue frontage. Um, we are not counting that, of course, as part of the 10,000 square foot uh, POPs proposal. Uh, 
taken as a whole, um, not including the requirement, we are increasing the uh, open space at grade um, relative to what we have today by close to 150 uh, percent. So there are significant improvements over and above what is required that are going to be uh, presented as part Do of you have a program. square footage number in terms of how much additional square footage you're adding in terms of like public realm and pedestrian area? We're happy to provide that to you. If you bought an estimate? I, I don't off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay, you can get that to us. Um, the uh, building, I think, is going to be closed for maybe five or six years, as I understand it, as you do underdo your work, which is going to lead to a lot of employee displacement here, your, your employees and contracted employees. Can you tell us what the plans for where people are going in that time, what's happening to building staff that works in the building, uh, and what are the plans in that interim period for relocating uh, staff and employees? I, I can start with, uh, with our employees. We have um, now relocated 100 percent of the employees that were, um, that were assigned to 270 Park Avenue. Uh, as David mentioned, we have, uh, we have built uh, close to a million and a half square feet of, of swing space that will serve as our interim headquarters uh, across the neighborhood in five locations. Um, uh, and that, that, those moves are complete as of Friday. Um, we are incredibly proud to, to report that the building services staff, all 120 of them, uh, have been uh, relocated to interim sites or other J.P. Morgan Chase facilities uh, in the city as part of this move. Um, and those who were, those employees, the service employees who were uh, uh, reti eligible for retirement were, uh, were offered an enhanced package uh, through the union and our partners. Uh, it's something that we feel incredibly uh, good about. No one was displaced as part of this move. So anybody who's working the building today has a, has a continued job for that period as long as they're that's correct uh, okay thank you for that um, and um, the, uh, the you have a, you also own the building I think right across the street on Madison Avenue 383 Madison Avenue are there any any plans in the few, in the in the near term for uh, what to do with that site it's one of, one of our two owned uh, locations in Midtown, um, the other being 270 Park Avenue, of course. Um, you know, as David mentioned, it is a building that has not seen um, a lot of love over the years, and uh, it is now serving as our world headquarters while we redevelop 270 Park. Uh, so we do plan to invest uh, considerable amounts of capital into the building um, while we're there and while it serves as the interim headquarters. Uh, and, and from that perspective, you know, we have, um, we have nothing but uh, the intent to, to improve it and, and make sure it uh, remains one of our two owned assets in Midtown. Okay, thank you. I'm going to close some questions down here. I just wanted to just some, some follow-up comments here. Is one is um, some clarity on, par as we, you know, as we kind of in the next few weeks, some clarity on the Park Avenue side in terms of the design of it, but also any ways to further enhance the Park Avenue side uh, which I think, I think there's plans around the Metro North to, uh, to do some work around the medians and stuff like that. I know there's been discussion about how to bring Park Avenue a bit more to life, especially as you're talking about the tensions at East Metairie Zoning, which is to make it a good place for people to work and to make it a modernized space, uh, not just to focus on Madison Avenue, but to really make Park Avenue a, a welcoming uh, avenue as well. Um, two is, um, you know, more definition if you can, as you can give it to us on the MTA, uh, your commitments around the MTA, and I, I, you know, I, we've, this has been a, a constant part, you know, point of information between us is that um, we're going to be bringing a lot of people into that one specific site, but also the East Metairie zoning is intention is, and we know there's four, you know, I think four other sites even today being discussed, maybe, maybe, maybe even more, maybe less, but um, a lot of people that uh, are coming to East Midtown, the plan you know, asks for transit improvements and public realm improvements that accompany that, but it's not to say that those are the minimum requirements. I, I, I commend you guys for going further than, than the minimum and making a real commitment underneath and around, but I will, I will never stop asking for more uh, around the MTA and public realm because it's going to be congested and it's, we're in, a, we're in a, a really necessary moment to address kind of critical infrastructure in MTA. Um, and and last, I mean, I, I, I wanted to uh, commend you for some recent announcements around um, your uh, uh, decisions around invest in some certain investments related to uh, private prisons and things like that. And we, we commend you for being a good corporate partner. Um, and as your like long-term 
trajectory here in, uh, in New York City. We, we really um, you know, view you as, a, as a, uh, uh, a partner here in the city, so those types of commitments to New York City being here is, is welcome. Um, but we'll you know, always continue to look for ways to make sure there's a, a good partnership between New York City and, and a, a major employer like J.P. Morgan. Um, and um, I, will, I will end my comments, my questions there. Thank you to the chair. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I will be calling up the next panel, um, Devon Lomax, Rachel uh, Petrikoff, Max Sheeran, and Casey Carrillo. If you could just please state your name, uh, you can begin uh, your testimony. Uh, Devon Lomax. Um, is it the afternoon yet? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Moya uh, and the subcommittee. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, giving me the chance, to, the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Devon Lomax. Again, I'm with District Council 9, the Painters and Allied Trades Union. Um, we rise in full support, all 11,000 members of, of this union rise in support of this project. Um, I, su I submitted my testimony, but I'm just going to speak uh, freely. Uh, this project really is just about jobs for us. Um, you know, the construction industry is really in a boom right now. Um, a lot of our members are working, um, and really I wanted to just talk about apprenticeship and what, um, and I commend J.P. Morgan Chase for committing to uh, building this project union um, and committing to apprenticeship programs. Um, I myself came from apprenticeship program with District Council 9, and I could tell you a project like this, of this scale uh, would mean a lot to our members uh, that are apprentices now um, to, get, to continue their training and continue their careers in construction. Um, you, know, you know, this, this, uh, this committee you know, sends a lot of projects through, um, and again, this one would mean a lot to us, um, for our members um, all across New York City. We have pre-apprenticeship programs that will be working um, on this project from non-traditional employment for women to construction skills to veterans, uh, helmets to hard hats for veterans. Um, and again, this project would mean a lot to us um, to get passed. So we, we, uh, we're here in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Just make sure the red light is on. There you go. Good afternoon, my name is Rochelle Patrickoff. I thank you for the opportunity to present these comments on behalf of uh, the Grand Central Partnership. The Grand Central Partnership enthusiastically supports the application by J.P. Morgan Chase requesting an amendment to the East Midtown zoning text to enable it to build a new state-of-the-art, open-air, publicly accessible, privately-owned public space on the Madison Avenue frontage of a newly planned 270 Park Avenue office tower that would be home to all of its global headquarter operations. As you know, the partnership was pleased to have partnered with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, former council member Dan Gorodnik, and other neighborhood stakeholders to help frame and shape the process for the rezoning of Greater East Midtown. These zoning changes facilitate this new development and others to build modern office towers to accommodate the needs of businesses in the 21st century with new open energy efficient office tower. It's also responsible for the creation of public realm improvements included much needed mass transit enhancements. East Midtown rezoning is enabling one of New York City's largest employers to demonstrate its long-term commitment to New York City and Greater Midtown East and the Grand Central neighborhood with the 21st Century Headquarters building that will be designed to not only meet the needs of its workforce and global business, but to also contribute to the vitality of our community. 
The current application that is before the City Council today will enable J.P. Morgan Chase to introduce a spectacular, open, and accessible green urban space for the benefit of the Midtown East community. In order to deliver this new POPs, J.P. Morgan Chase is asking for this text amendment to shift the location of a 10,000 square foot POPs from a mid-block location to Madison Avenue. The text amendment also seeks to modify street wall retail continuity and design regulations in order to permit this open green space at the alternate Madison Avenue location. The shift of the POPs to Madison Avenue will offer the community two significant and valuable benefits. First, improving pedestrian traffic along a heavily trafficked Madison Avenue, and second, the cantilever design of 270 Park Avenue rising above the Pops will provide additional sunlight to the open space, improve sightliness for pedestrians walking along Madison Avenue. This area will also be the entrance to east side access, and the gateway to Midtown East will benefit by an open and welcoming new public space. We commend J.P. Morgan Chase for hearing the comments and concerns of Community Board 5 and Borough President Brewer during this process and making dramatic and impactful positive modifications to the vision and reality of this proposed new public space. We're proud to join with the Borough President in supporting this application. We look forward to continuing to work with J.P. Morgan Chase, Council Member Keith Powers, and our neighborhood stakeholders on this exciting project thank, thank as you. we encourage thank the you. approval of this text amendment. Thank you so much. I thank just want to uh, remind everyone to please to try to keep it to two minutes. We do have other hearings uh, that we have to uh, uh, have here, and we have to be out of here by 1 o'clock. So thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Cassie Carrillo, and I'm speaking today on behalf of SEIU 32BJ to express our support for the proposed text amendment at 270 Park Avenue. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country. We represent over 80,000 building service workers in New York City. J.P. Morgan Chase has a strong relationship with 32BJ, and we are happy to support their project to build a state-of-the-art, energy-efficient tower in Midtown East. This project will allow our members to continue to build their skills in green buildings, offer a new privately owned public space, and much needed mass transit improvements. Throughout this process, J.P. Morgan Chase has shown their commitment to New York City, and we recognize them as a responsible employer with a strong track, re track record of creating good jobs. We respectfully urge you to approve this text amendment. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Max Sheeran. I'm a business agent with Local 638 Steamfitters. Um, I'll submit my testimony, but I'd rather speak frankly. Um, a lot of things are said today, and I take my hat off to you, Councilman Powers, for uh, thoroughly um, going over this whole text amendment. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, as a business agent on the east side of Manhattan, I couldn't think of a more responsible company to lead the way um, in the east side rezoning process here. Um, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of companies come and go, but J.P. Morgan has always been responsible with wages in the community. They've always employed the highest wages possible. And that means a lot to my members, over 8,000 members with their families. Uh, we have retirees that built this iconic city skyline that we would like to continue doing in the future and uh, I would just rise in support of this text amendment. I appreciate your time. Thank you, and always good to see our brothers and sisters from DC9, the Steam Fitters, and 32BJ uh, all uh, together in one. Uh, this is a very good project, I think, when uh, we can have uh, organized labor all come together uh, for something uh, as critical as this. So it's always good to see uh, our brothers and sisters here participating in uh, these hearings. Thank you so much uh, to the panelists. Um, and we are going to move to the next panel. Uh, Lizette Chapa Chaparro from the uh, Manhattan Borough President's Office and Joseph uh, Colella.
good afternoon, Chair Moya and uh, members of the Subcommittee of uh, Zoning and Franchises. My name is Lizette Chaparro. I am an urban planner for Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. And I'm here on her behalf to deliver a statement in support of the proposed uh, text amendment for 270 Park Avenue. Uh, when the mayor's office um, proposed to rezone the East Midtown uh, neighborhood in 2014, um, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer joined uh, then council member Dan Gorodnik, along with um, members of the community board and other stakeholders in participa participating in the East Midtown Steering Committee. And it was truly a community planning process. Uh, the steering committee helped guide uh, the rezoning by developing a list of priorities and recommendations for the district. A principal concern throughout that planning process um, was the public realm. A broad range of people, including businesses, employees, preservation groups, and the real estate industry all agreed that without quality public space in East Midtown, um, we would not be fostering places where people would want to spend time, and we would not be taking part in good planning. In light of those concerns, the Department of City Planning requir required that sites like 270 Park Avenue um, provide a publicly accessible space that is at least 10,000 square feet and that is open to the sky. And that is why the borough president was disappointed uh, to learn that J.P. Morgan was proposing a space um, initially that would only be 7,000 7, square feet and would be, would be enclosed. Um, while the borough president was sensitive to the site constraints that J.P. Morgan was facing, um, she was not convinced that those constraints warranted an open space that deviated so far from those requirements. Uh, the borough president believes that quality um, open spaces are an amenity that mediate uh, the density of office uses in East Midtown and issued a recommendation in January um, because she believed that J.P. Morgan could fit a 10,000 square foot um, space on the site. Uh, the presentation here today calls for just that. Um, the borough president still has a few other um, recommendations to the applicant. Um, she's pleased to see that there will be a new station entrance on East 48th Street, um, but uh, urges the applicant to also look beyond the footprint of their building as they are um, planning improvements to the Grand Central train shed, and also requests that uh, there be further clarifications to um, the portions of Section 3770 that the applicant is requesting um, to modify or get an Thank exemption. you. Thank you so much. Thank sure. you for your testimony. Uh, good morning. I'm Joseph Colella, and I'm here on behalf of the New York Building Congress. Uh, we include more than 500 constituent organizations in New York's design, construction, and real estate industry. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the application on behalf of the Building Congress. The Building Congress wholeheartedly supported the East Midtown rezoning when city planning crafted it in 2017. Now we urge this body to support the zoning text amendment that will facilitate the construction of J.P. Morgan Chase's new world headquarters in East Midtown and better integrate the accompanying public space. This project, the first major development of the 2017 East Midtown rezoning, advances the key public policy goals of the rezoning, the creation of meaningful public spaces that residents and visitors will enjoy, and the development of modern, sustainable office space in a variety of methods. Firstly, this application addresses unique constraints at this specific site and will allow for the construction of a 10,000 square foot open air public plaza on Madison Avenue that will revitalize the area and provide substantial public benefits. J.P. Morgan Chase has retained leading architects Norman Foster and Partners and Vishan Chakrabarti of PAO to design a world-class building with thoughtful, well-integrated public spaces. The headquarters project demonstrates J.P. Morgan Chase's commitment to New York City and its diverse, skilled workforce. The new building will accommodate up to 12,000 J.P. Morgan Chase employees in a wide range of high-earning 21st century jobs. The project will be governed by a project labor agreement and will create approximately 8,000 union construction jobs. It will also provide substantial opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses, many of whom are members of the building community. In addition, J.P. Morgan Chase has made a $42 million contribution to the Public Realm Improvement Fund, which the East Midtown Governing Group will determine how best to invest these funds to improve public space in the area. Overall, this text amendment facilitates much needed advancement of spaces in the public realm, and the New York Building Congress urges you to support. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you both for your testimony today. Uh, I'm calling up the next panel, uh, Lynn uh, Ellsworth and Tara Kelly. Thank you. Just make sure your microphone is on and state your name and you may begin. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I prepared this a little bit on the fly. I'm Lynn Ellsworth. I'm chair of the Tribeca Trust. I founded the Alliance for a Human Scale City and the nonprofit I'm president of is called Human Scale NYC. And I'm here to raise three policy points that I think that this uh, uh, project uh, fails to address that I would hope that the city council gets on. Uh, the first one is that this site was not included as a development site in the Midtown East rezoning, so it didn't get the full treatment of the environmental review process. So it's and able to escape that. And so, which raises the policy question, how will you treat that in the future? Will it just be case by case like this? Uh, the second issue has to do with POPs. Um, I have personally visited every single POPs below 14th Street and a large sample of POPs in Midtown and in other parts of the city as parts of a POPs review project. They are in terrible shape. Uh, property owners do not live up to what they promised. Some of them putting lipstick on a pig would be a compliment in those cases. So you get beautiful images. It's, you don't really know what you're really gonna get. And the issue that raises is that you don't have a regulatory framework to manage POPs, to enforce the rules on POPs, and to make people live up to their promises, and that's citywide. So how would this be any different? Uh, and last, I think that this case raises some important points about campaign finance. Um, you know, I sort of wonder why it wasn't included as a development site. A lot of other questions about this particular site, but I do notice that J.P. Morgan's attorneys paid $186,000 in campaign contributions to Dan Gorodnik over his cycle as council member. And that's only that one. I didn't count SL Greens. So the conclusion I have is there's an opportunity in the city charter to lower the campaign finance contribution to $500, and I would hope that the city Thank council you. Thank you. gets Thank in you on your it. Testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and Council Member Powers. I'm Tara Kelly with the Municipal Arts Society. Uh, before the Council today is the first zoning text amendment under Greater East Midtown. We'd be remiss if we did not take note that this proposal seeks to demolish the Union Carbide Building, a treasured piece of New York's modernist history. Indeed, MAS has been advocating for the preservation of this building for years. As we wrote in our 2013 report, a bold vision for the future in East Midtown, quote, Built for the Union Carbide Company, 200, 270 Park Avenue is one of the greatest buildings of that era. At the time of completion, the Union Carbide Building was the tallest stainless steel clad building in the world and Park Avenue's tallest skyscraper, as well as Manhattan's tallest building constructed since 1933. Now it will be the tallest building ever ten intentionally torn down. At the very least, its replacement should be a significant improvement to the public realm. East Midtown, as we all know, desperately needs open space. One of the key recommendations from the steering committee was the requirement for buildings larger than 30,000 square feet to include a POPs. As a result, 16 new POPs could potentially be built in this neighborhood. Therefore, we have great interest in ensuring that this first new POPs in East Midtown is truly effective and inviting, setting a precedent for those to come in the future. While we commend J.P. Morgan Chase for being responsive to comments from Community Board 5 and the Borough President's Office, we have great concern about the proposed location of the POPs. Madison Avenue is congested and narrow. It includes five major bus routes with stops on the eastern side of the street. Moreover, the east side of Madison Avenue is typically shrouded in shadow for large portions of the day throughout the year. Meanwhile, the Park Avenue side of the proposed building is more inviting. Park Avenue has sufficient sidewalk space to accommodate an infinitely more appealing open space. The east and west sides of Park Avenue in the vicinity are popular locations for workers and visitors to eat lunch, lunch, rest, socialize in a sunny location. Traffic would be farther away from POPs visitors. As such, we find Park Avenue to be a significantly more conducive location for an enjoyable public space. 
Given the prominence the new headquarters will have, this POPs represents an opportunity to create quality open space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just, I thank you. I, I want to just, I just want to address one of the, the, just a couple things here. One is on the EIS question, because it's a good question around the EIS and whether uh, the East Midtown anticipated one site or the other, because there certainly will be others that will come before this council that were not anticipated sites. But the, but the zone was anticipated and the land use and the, and the finite amount of air rights that are available here was anticipated. So the EIS that covers it may, may not anticipate one particular site, but certainly anticipates the zone. I'm not going to address the comments about the campaign contributions. I just will refute and dismiss that I, I don't think that's an intention here, and I I, uh, I don't want this to be clad in any in any you know concern around uh, motivations or intentions. I think this was brought forward by the Bloomberg administration. My predecessor and the borough president did a good job of slowing that process down as they exited and to make it a more deliberate process with much more public input. And that public input, for what it's worth, has led to the POPs going from an, an enclosed POPs to being a, a, uh, uh, an open air. It's a very good point, though, around uh, maintenance of the POPs, and we will have to, you know, we'll talk to J.P. Morgan about how they will pre prepare to maintain that open space. But it was really from the, the open, I mean, there was a discussion around whether it would be private or public, and uh, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, uh, open or unopen, and the concern was that it would be private if it was enclosed, and so we asked for it to be something that would be more open to the public, but I, it's a good comment. I'll take that back to them about how to do maintenance on that public space in the future. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and it will be laid over. Uh, our last public hearing for today is on the pre-considered LU item for the Residential Mechanical Voids Text Amendment in Council's uh, Districts 1 through 9, 16, 26, and 27. Uh, the Department of City Planning seeks approval of a zoning text amendment for residential buildings in high-density tower districts to discourage the use of excessive tall mechanical floors that elevate upper, uh, upper story residential units above the surrounding uh, context. The proposed change would apply to residential towers in non-contextual R9 and R10 residential districts and their equivalent commercial districts. Uh, as of today, members of the City Council have collectively received hundreds of letters from constituents as part of the public review process. Uh, the zoning resolution is meant to provide consistency and predictability for developers, community groups, policymakers, and all New Yorkers. Uh, when we and our communities are asked to accept additional density uh, through rezonings, we also need clear and transparent laws to address legitimate concerns about the circumventing of our zoning rules. Uh, it is our duty as lawmakers to create rules that promote responsible growth. Today, luxury housing developers throughout the city are shaping our skyline in ways uh, that were not anticipated or imagined by the original drafters of our current zoning laws, and that is a problem. We remain committed to working with our community advocates to strengthen our existing rules and update them to reflect changes in design and engineering. Uh, I now want to open this public hearing on this application, uh, but first I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Kalos uh, for some remarks. Uh, thank you to Zoning Chair Moya and to the Land Use staff for all the hard work on this. I want to start by thanking uh, the Department of City Planning for uh, doing an enormous study and being responsive to the community uh, in Manhattan and in parts of the city where towers can be built. Uh, which is largely on the avenues on the Upper East, Upper West Sides, Midtown, and uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, we started to see a situation where tall buildings that were 20 or 30 stories did not necessarily translate to 200 or 300 feet. Uh, we saw 432 Park Avenue with Raphael Vignoli, where 25% of that building was empty, and then he came back at 249 East 62nd and put a 150-foot uh, space. Uh, initially, we pursued uh, a a straight height cap, which is something that city planning had already rejected at our East River 50s Alliance, but working with uh, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, uh, Landmark West, uh, I, I see some other groups, uh, including uh, the East 60, sorry, the West 64th through 66th Street Block Association and Save Central Park. 
Uh, all of us have, and, and uh, Historic District Council, many of us have been working together along with uh, elected officials throughout the borough of Manhattan uh, on trying to close this loophole and uh, hoping to be uh, the first of many. So I just want to thank everyone for their partnership. I believe it is a, a step in the right direction. I'm hoping that there will be further steps and you know a lot of folks are here to testify about ways we were hoping for some improvements and I will leave the rest for some of my questions. Thank you. Uh, I now turn it over to Councilmember Powers for his remarks. Thank you. I'll be I'll be brief. Um, I want to first thank Councilman Kalos for his leadership around this issue, and many of the groups in my district, MAS, Friends of the Upper East Side, and others who have been. Uh, you know, creating clarity around this mechanical voice and Councilman Rosenthal as well. Um, you know, in, in contrast to this midtown rezoning, which created rules of the road moving forward, I think that the concern many of the Manhattan members have, including myself, are that when we create the rules of the road, we should we should make sure people follow them. And in the instances where people are building, you know, very very large voids and taking what we think is uh, a, a back door around the the zoning uh, the zoning tax and. Zoning in the city, we you know we get concerned about really um, uh, about what the rules of the road are. So I, I thank city planning for being here. I believe, like others, I think we could be even more ambitious with this proposal, cover more territory, do more in terms of where we are today. Um, but I, I am appreciative of having this before us. And and I'll just say that you know we can have a real conversation around how high and how big in in this city, and we should when we have things like needing to build housing and needing to address. Uh, uh, critical needs in the city. Uh, it gets harder to, with the public, and the public has a hard time trusting uh, having a real conversation, letting the elected officials lead that conversation when we find people being creative in terms of how they uh, build around what we set forward for them. So I am, um, I am supportive of, of uh, uh, what we have here today, but I do think it, we could go further, and I, I do hope we will be back here in the future talking in more, uh, in more detail about other ways to continue to do this loophole and other loopholes. And with that being said, I uh, just want to again thank my colleagues and maybe I see Committee Board 8 here as well who have been uh, leading this conversation here. And thank you to Chair Moya again. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, call Edith Su Chen and Christopher Hayer. Hayner. Uh, one second, please. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal for a few comments. I appreciate that, Chair. Sorry to slip in at the last moment there, and certainly I'm looking forward to hearing from city planning. But I, too, have been working on this um, issue of the mechanical void space and the ridiculous loopholes that developers keep taking advantage of, um, you know. So I'm going to read a statement that uh, um, is really directed toward the larger concern of uh, what it means when a developer takes advantage of a loophole uh, or creates a loophole or um, you know reads something that's out of context and out of the spirit of what a community needs and wants, um, and that's what I'm addressing. Um, here today. So amidst the significant community concern and feedback, in, in 2018, de Blasio administration committed to look into closing loopholes that allow developers to artificially inflate the height of buildings, including regulating excessive mechanical voids. The super tall buildings which result from these excessive voids serve no public policy goal. And that's really the heart of what I want to talk about. There's no affordable housing that's coming out of the use of this loophole. So what, what started this conversation was a developer saying they were going to build a building really tall, and in order to make it even taller, uh, have a 160-foot mechanical void space, thereby not using up any technical speaking FAR. Fine, now we're getting basically uh, what would normally be, oh, I didn't realize I was on the clock. Thank you. What would normally be uh, something like a 70-story building, um, you know, with the, 
what would normally be and what is in context would be a 20-story, 25-story building. But with a 160-foot mechanical void space, the lawyers and the developers fix, figured out a way to get luxury condominiums up higher. So a building that is ostensibly 77 stories tall um, will only have about 120 units, 120 apartments, all luxury condominium. There's no affordable housing. There's no attempt at supporting affordable housing. So what we're getting is a high rise for no public policy goal and no help from the administration to limit the height, which is completely out of context for the Upper West Side. But now I'll stick to my written remarks. More and more frequently around the city, we I, see- I'm, I'm sorry, Councilor. Uh, I will Amber, submit re, my re, remarks for the record. Thank you. And you get what it's I'm two saying. two minutes for, for everyone. You. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yep, absolutely. Council, can you please uh, swear in the panel? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully, and please state your name as part of your response? Ida Su Chen, yes, I do. Excuse me. Ida Su Chen, yes, I do. Christopher Hayner, yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and all council members. My name is Ida Su Chen. I'm the director of the Manhattan office at the Department of City Planning. I'm here with my colleague, Chris Hayner, of the zoning division. We are here to present to you our proposal on residential tower mechanical voids. In recent years, some developments have been proposed or built that use mechanical floors that are much taller than necessary in order to boost upper story residential units above the surrounding context and to improve views for those units. These excessively tall mechanical spaces are called mechanical voids. This practice has emerged in large part because current zoning does not count mechanical floor space as part of zoning floor area calculations, and there's no explicit height limit on these spaces. Last year, upon the request from communities and elected officials, the mayor asked DCP to examine the issue of excessively tall mechanical spaces in residential areas and to provide a recommendation by the end of 2018. We in the administration concur with many members of the public and elected officials that this practice is an abuse of current zoning. DCP conducted an exhaustive citywide analysis of construction in the last decade to better understand the mechanical needs of residential buildings and to assess where these excessive mechanical spaces are being used. We examined building permits for 800 buildings in R6 through R10 zoning districts and their commercial equivalents. In R6, R7, and R8 districts, we found no examples of excessive mechanical spaces, and this is because building heights are effectively limited by a rule called the sky exposure plane. We also examined buildings in R9 and R10 tower districts where towers are allowed to penetrate the sky exposure plane, and the vast majority of them exhibited consistent and perfectly reasonable configurations of mechanical floors. However, in these R9 and R10 tower districts, we did find a handful of towers that contained extremely tall mechanical spaces, singular or stacked spaces. So let's take a moment to look at a tower with typical mechanical space configuration. Excuse me, I see there's um, something funny happening on the monitor, but I believe the council members, you have printouts. Let's, let's see. I, I apologize for that glitch. Um, here um, on the lower portion of the tower, you would see um, a, a, a red band. I guess you can kind of see it there. Um, uh, you, will, you will find a mechanical floor at lower levels, usually between the non-residential and res residential segments of the building. Taller towers often have one or two additional mechanical floors in the middle of the tower, which helps to distribute mechanical needs more efficiently. Finally, there's usually a larger mechanical bulkhead at the top of the building. Now let's take a look at examples of what is not typical. On the example, uh, on the left, you will see one very tall singular space. On the right, you will see a clustering of multiple mechanical floors. In both cases, these mechanical void spaces are lifting residential units higher, commanding better views, and higher prices for the developer. These excessively tall mechanical spaces make bad neighbors in residential areas. They are blank walls or empty spaces and do not engage with the surroundings. We regard the practice of providing excessive mechanical voids as an abuse of the zoning regulations, and we propose to put an end to this practice. 
So our goals for the proposal are to limit the use of artificially tall residential mechanical voids, and encourage residential buildings that activate and engage with their surroundings, while also recognize the need for reasonably sized and appropriately distributed mechanical spaces in residential buildings. And we also do need to continue to support the flexibility for architectural expression and innovations in sustainability. Uh, before I get to describing the proposed rules, uh, I, I'd like to note that during the public review process, the City Planning Commission heard and received testimony from engineering, architecture, and building industry experts that stated our original proposal to limit mechanical space to 25 feet in height may be too restrictive, and they recommended an, an increase in height. These experts noted that best practices for future energy conservation, resiliency, and sustainability uh, might require more flexible mechanical spaces. Uh, taking this expert uh, input into account, the CPC modified the department's proposal by adding five feet to the height, changing the maximum mechanical space allowance from 25 feet to 30 feet. Okay, so let's get to our proposal. Um, first, the most basic rule. Any mechanical floor that has a height greater than 30 feet would be counted as zoning floor area. And the taller the mechanical void gets, the bigger the penalty. It's important to underscore that this is a major change in zoning policy and regulations. For the first time ever, mechanical space would be charged against allowable FAR. This rule is a huge disincentive for any developer to provide a mechanical space taller than 30 feet. So here on this slide, we have an example. If a mechanical void is 132 feet, that space would count as floor, excuse me, four floors of zoning floor area. Uh, the math is 132 feet divided by 30 feet, you get 4.4. The developer loses four floors. Um, I would also like to note that mechanical penthouses above the highest residential floor is not subject to our proposed regulation. So just very quickly, uh, this chart shows, again, the taller the mechanical void, the bigger the penalty. So just for an example, a 31-foot mechanical void would result in a one-floor penalty. If you have a 150-foot tall mechanical void that would result in five floors knocked off the building. Okay. Next, we proposed an anti-clustering rule. So if a mechanical floor is located within 75 feet of another mechanical floor, then their heights are aggregated. And if that aggregate is more than 30 feet, then it is counted, counted as zoning floor area. This is regardless of the height of each individual floor. So in, a, in this example, the clustered mechanical spaces results in a penalty of three floors. It, it, it's a total of uh, 80 feet here. Uh, for mixed-use buildings, mechanical spaces serving residential floor space would be subject to the proposed regulations. And mechanical spaces serving commercial or community facility uses would also be subject to the same anti-clustering rule if those uses occupy less than 25% of the building. Uh, this is a summary page of our of, of the major moves. So again, any mechanical void that's taller than 30 feet will count as zoning floor area, and we are providing a mechanical, excuse me, we are providing an anti-clustering rule. These rules would apply to residential towers in R9 and R10 tower districts and their equivalent commercial districts. Special, they also applies to special zoning districts that use the tower floor regulations, for example, part of the Lincoln Square Special District. It also applies to special districts that impose special tower bulk regulations, uh, such as part of West Chelsea and part of Clinton. As you can see on this map, our proposal applies to areas in Manhattan and to very small areas in Queens and the Bronx. Uh, finally, um, in response to additional concerns from communities and elected officials we heard in the past year, we are also committed to the following. One, uh, DCP, we will propose a second phase of this proposal to address residential tower mechanical voids in central business districts, specifically in Lower Manhattan, Midtown, Hudson Yards, Downtown Brooklyn, and Long Island City. And DCP, we will also conduct a study on unenclosed voids in residential buildings to understand how these features are used and whether they warrant regulation. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our proposal, and uh, Chris and I are glad to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, the two buildings that came up uh, again and again, as we know, uh, the 30 3 West 66th Street uh, and then 249 East 62nd Street, 
I understand DCP included this in their study. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And could you describe what was learned about the void spaces in those buildings? Uh, what we learned in the West 66th Street space was that there is there was a mechanical void proposed of 160 feet. Um, we heard from the community. We heard from local electeds. Councilmember Rosenthal, um, and uh, we we shared the concern that this 160-foot void was uh, the sole purpose was to vault the upper units to command better views and better prices uh, for the developer. We did not believe that this void contributed to the neighborhood because it is a, a blank space with mechanical space on on, on the floor. Um, that, that is what we found in our research for West 66. And excuse me, Chair Moya, the, the second building you cited, the address? It was uh, 249 uh, E62nd Street. Uh, we, we reviewed the preliminary plans for that building as well, and we found a mechanical void of, uh, I do not recall the total height, excuse me. I do not recall the total height, but again, excessively tall, um, uh, uh, much taller than necessary to provide for the mechanical for mechanical purposes. So, will this text amendment be applicable to the voids, uh, the void spaces in these buildings, or no? The uh, the text will be applicable, um, provided that the buildings have not vested, meaning that foundations uh, have not been uh, uh, constructed pursuant to the proposal. Uh, I, I, am, I am not aware of the exact status of where those buildings are in the permitting process. Great. So it's, it's my understanding that uh, DCP has committed to follow-up action to expand the area of applicability uh, for this text amendment. Is that correct? We are following up on a uh, study. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, first to, in, by the end of summer, this summer, 2019, we will take on a second phase of this proposal um, and look at the central business districts that I mentioned, Lower Manhattan, Hudson Yards, Midtown, Long Island City, and Downtown Brooklyn. Could you just describe the scope of what that uh, commitment looks like? We would look at residential towers in the R9 and R10 districts and the commercial equivalents and, um, and, 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 do this and do a study that essentially does the same that we have done here for phase one. Okay. And at, at this time, can uh, you commit to addressing the unenclosed structural voids, uh, aka stilts, uh, in the follow-up action? I think it's, it's premature to commit to an action per se, but we are 100% committed to a study to look at these unenclosed spaces. These unenclosed spaces are, a, I have a very different nature and characteristic than the, en, than the enclosed spaces. We have a much wider variety of unenclosed spaces. Some of these spaces people really don't like. Some of these spaces, these unenclosed spaces, people love. We are talking about spaces that may be terraces or arcades or, um, you know, you think of the Citigroup building, think of the Loja at one center street. Um, it is, a, it is a, a, a body of spaces um, that has a much wider variety, a much uh, higher degree of subjectivity with respect to whether it's, you know, a good thing, a bad thing, liked, not liked. We would do an exhaustive study at the unenclosed spaces and residential towers. I do believe it's, it's premature to commit to an action. So no. Pardon? So no. Uh, it's, it, we, would, we are committing to a study. Okay. It's premature, yes. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Council Member Kalos, mm -hmm. uh, who has some questions. Uh, thank you to the Department of City Planning for studying the issue of mechanical voids and recommending a limit of mechanical space heights of 25 feet every 75 feet. I feel it's a step in the right direction. Uh, as, as you are aware, I testified for a little bit uh, further, and I think that is something that every community board also agreed to, and more than ne nearly half a dozen elected officials. Uh, now, what was surprising was that the City Planning Commission ignored your recommendations and your research and actually went the other direction from what everyone was asking for, at least from our side, and went to 30 feet. Uh, do you stand by your recommendation of 25 feet? Uh, would DC or would DCP support the council if we were to amend the proposal back to the 25 feet that you had recommended? We, we would support uh, 
the city council modification uh, the 25 feet uh, was uh, part of our original proposal. The city planning commission did take into consideration input from expert practitioners and, and made the modification. Um, but we believe 25 feet uh, would, would, be, would, would be sufficient to accommodate. In, in your research, did you come across any existing spaces that were exactly 30 feet where that extra five feet was necessary? Um, we did not, but we actually heard a lot of testimony from engineers that actually challenged us to be to future proof this and to look forward a little bit. Um, and they told us to be cognizant of uh, in, coming changes to the energy code um, that would actually put more stringent standards on um, HVAC equipment. Um, and one thing they also noted was to also be cognizant of you know the in, impending climate change and the need in flood zones to actually elevate large mechanical equipment out of the sub out of the cellar and sub -cellar. So with those two kind of things in mind, I think that's really what the, uh, the commission was looking at and the reason for the change. But there's no current buildings with 30 foot mechanics. Not that we have seen in our historic, you know, look backward 10 years. And uh, right now we're looking at 25 feet, which would be generous, but it, we don't necessarily need to future proof everything because legislation is iterative and you could, we could come back and change it if we needed to. Is that correct? That's a correct That's statement. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as we considered this donating text, one of the buildings with a 150 foot mechanical void at 249 East 62nd Street, uh, the developer just pulled the sides off their mechanical space. I want to thank you for your commitment today under oath that you will be studying the unenclosed mechanical voids, also known as stilts. Uh, when does the Department of City Planning expect to have the results of this study? It is, again, it would be an exhaustive study, it would be comprehensive, um, and this study that we looked at for enclosed spaces took us a year, over a year. So I think it would be fair to say that a study of the unenclosed spaces would take at least that. Okay, that is, that is helpful to know, at least for our purposes in planning and whether you're on the preservation side or the development side, at least there's, uh, I think, fair notice. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing I would just distinguish is at the municipal building, the, the space there, the archway, uh, the vaults are public spaces with an enhanced subway entrance. At the city group landmark, it is a enhanced public space uh, with an enhanced subway entrance that is open to the general public. It helped preserve a church. There is a mall, but it is all usable by people from the general public who are not tenants of the existing space, and it is usable space that enhances the uh, uh, street streetscape. And I guess I, I mentioned it at the hearing, but I would reiterate, do you see a difference between uh, s spaces that are created at the ground level that can create an enhanced streetscape and spaces that are created now at uh, 249 East 62nd Street, where it is a roof deck, uh, which is not accessible to anyone because it is a mechanical roof deck or, or what have you. Would, is that is fair to distinguish between the two? Sure, absolutely. That's a very... Uh, and I guess the other last question, I appreciate the chair for his indulgence, is just we made a, a lot of recommendations. And I think when we first sat down with the study from uh, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, we were looking at the floor to ceiling heights, we were looking at the mechanical voids, we were looking at gerrymandered zoning lots, uh, fl uh, also some of the amenity spaces. We're now going to see buildings being built with 60 foot transparent slides, which I believe are the next set of voids. Why did DCP focus on that one issue and uh, what about the other issues that we did bring to your attention in terms of future studies on those items? This, the, the practice of mechanical, excessive mechanical voice was something that was emerging and real and they were seeing it. Um, there were some other uh, issues that were raised, uh, for example, floor to ceiling heights or a zoning lot merger that you raised um, that uh, warrant uh, much, much, much more extensive study. The, the definition of zoning lot is a fundamental building block of New York City's zoning resolution. 
um, to take a look at a redefin redefinition of that is a massive undertaking. With respect to floor to ceiling heights, um, you know, New York City, we've never regulated floor to ceiling heights before, and we have taken into consideration that there's a wide variety of floor to ceiling heights. Different buildings have different needs. There's also his historic you know, um, uh, uh, tall floors. We have parlor floors in brownstones. Um, uh, floor to ceiling heights uh, was a matter that we did not believe was appropriate to be regulated by zoning. My, my last question this round is just, my, my land use attorneys at the city council have advised that the best way to regulate the shape and form of buildings and development in the city is the zoning code. Uh, one of the things that is happening, and, and I actually do support the legislation in Albany carried by Senator Robert Jackson and Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal, would be for Albany to use the uh, multiple dwelling law to define the heights of the buildings if we can't do it through the zoning process. Uh, is DCP con considering the fact that if we aren't able to do this as a city that Albany might take that power from us? Uh, the, there is a proposed state law um, and uh, that proposed state law would alter the most basic definition in the city zoning resolution which is floor area in a way that effectively caps floor to ceiling heights in new construction at nine to 10 feet and renders thousands and thousands of existing buildings overbuilt. So again, this applies to brownstones and to towers and everything in between. So uh, we at City Planning, we really cannot overstate how blunt and far reaching and frankly problematic the effects of this, of a state bill would be on the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalos. I want to turn it over to Council Member uh, Rivera for some questions. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get a couple of comments on the record. We're clearly very disappointed that the Department of City Planning did not consider what we think is a truly encompassing text amendment when they first began examining these mechanical voids. This text amendment should have addressed a number of concerns, and we've brought some of them up today. The enclosed open spaces, mechanical voids greater than 75 feet apart, and the exploitation of these loopholes in non-covered residential and commercial districts. So specifically in my district, uh, Community Board 5 is still going to be prime for void, explo uh, void exploitation after the passage of this text amendment, and that just regards, it's, it seems just imbalanced. And so you spoke a lot about the outreach you did in speaking to the elected officials and the community boards, and we just feel like all of the feedback that, that we all gave, the advocates, the numerous groups, some of them which are here in the crowd, just was not taken into account. So clearly we're all pushing for modifying the proposal to bring the FAR threshold for this space back down to 25 feet. We're all going to be fighting for that ongoing and we will not quit. And, and furthermore, the Department of City Planning's mission statement is to plan for the future of New York City. But we feel like the text amendment that is before us is a reactive solution and it's not a planning solution. So other cities have found ways to limit and predict what these types of spaces look like and New York has to catch up and, and be comprehensive when they're really addressing building trends that we're seeing uh, just going forward. So we really do feel like further discussion is warranted. We do not feel like our comments were taken seriously and I just wanna know why warrant some of the things like enclosed open spaces, mechanical voids greater than 75 feet, why weren't they included before the scope of the text amendment was set? Uh, hello, council member. Um, uh, just one clarification. This, this proposal does deal with enclosed mechanical spaces. Okay. Um, and then with respect to the other items um, that you raised and council member Kalos has raised, um, there, there were many, many, there were several other things that we were asked to look at. Um, we had an opportunity to uh, address an issue that is very real and happening now and something that uh, we would uh, we want to put a stop to we believe it's an abuse of the existing zoning uh, regulations um, the the other items that you address um, I believe I, I covered in my response to council member Kalis but we do understand we hear and we understand um, the, the frustration um, from it's from just why why do we need pre predictability in some areas and not others we're, we're, we're trying to figure out your de your decision making during this entire process and we feel like some of what was concerned what what are some of the things that were addressed are the concerns of, of developers and not necessarily the community 
So after you do pass, you know, after the passage of this text amendment, what's going to stop developers from using structural voids in a similar fashion to mechanical voids? We're just trying to do a little bit of, of predictions and make sure that our communities are protected. We believe that developers will not provide excessive mechanical voids after this proposal. It is such a huge disincentive um, to have the most valuable floor area um, you know, taken off to, to not be able to build one, two, three, four, five floors of the building. It is a, it's a big financial disincentive. It's a big hit to developers. Um, we believe this is a, an effective, um, it's a very effective disincentive to see these future types of mechanical voids. Okay, so, and again, how much time for the, the, the study that you've committed to as a follow-up to Council Member Kalos's question? I just didn't hear, you said uh, it was gonna be it extensive. Is, it's a much more complicated subject, the subject of unenclosed voids, because it runs a, whole, a, a much wider gamut of types of spaces, spaces that people like, that people don't like. It's a much wider variety of spaces. So this study here, um, the study that led to this proposal took us one year. Uh, I th so I think it'd be very fair to say that a study on unenclosed voids would take at least that. Well, I guess thank you for your testimony again, you know, visiting community boards to gather feedback, and we, we feel like not a single piece of that feedback is included in the text amendment is incredibly disappointing. But, you know, thank you for answering our questions, and thank you to Chair Amoya for, for giving me this much time. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Council Member uh, Rivera. Uh, I now want to turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Rosenthal for a few questions. Thank you so much, Chair. And we've covered a lot of ground. So I'm not going to ask you to say a lot of it again. Um, and I think within the narrowest scope of enclosed mechanical voids, um, this is certainly from a structural engineering perspective, technically a step in the right direction or if not the answer. Um, so I thank you from a, a tiny technical structural uh, what is the right thing to do as an environmentalist. Um, but, I, but what's lost is the spirit of the question in the first place, right? The spirit of the question in the first place was, gee, there are a lot of things going on that um, loopholes that developers and their lawyers are taking advantage of how do we address this? And the mayor's answer was, well, let's shift it over to city planning. You know, you did technically this thing terrific, but it really is, I think what you're hearing today is meant for policymakers, right? That this is not, this doesn't help us from a public policy point of view. And just getting to the point of um, the gerrymandered zoning lot, for example, which my colleague brought up, um, which I'm very disappointed we had asked that you look at that that was not brought up. Um, look, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, a Supreme Court judge said that the BSA decision on the zoning lots at 200 Amsterdam were that they should look, that their ruling about them not being gerrymandered, the court asked them to put out an injunction and ask them to look at it again, with the implication meaning that the court thinks that the lots were gerrymandered. So this is an issue that the administration has known about for two years that we've been doing this fight. I mean, uh, again, you know, if we put it in the tiny little box of city planning, yes, we're asking you to look and we'd like a commitment from you that we would ask you to look at gerrymandered zoning lots, not, uh, and right away, because already the Supreme Court of New York is saying that they look gerrymandered to me, and they've asked the BSA to look at it again. I would imagine this would raise some red flags from city planning, no? I, I believe that project is going through a due process uh, for deliberations, and um, I just respectfully restate that this, this proposal before us is really about stopping a current abuse of the zoning resolution. And 
Right, so again, and I'll wrap it up because I, my colleagues have questions and we wanna hear from the public. Technically, this is a step in the right direction. From a public policy point of view, it misses the point wildly. And I would ask the mayor to come in and address the public policy issues at hand. We've got these developers building at all hours of the night because they're trying to get it done before uh, you know, the bureaucracy of city work stops them because they know it's wrong. And so they're building at midnight. And so in a residential neighborhood, we have these high rises going up. I'll get off my high horse. But the larger administration needs to address at least the issue of after hour work variances, which are given out like candy to children, uh, which is what's happening now, and, and address each of the other issues that a year ago we asked the administration to address like gerrymandered zoning lots, which is allowing a developer right now to build a 60-story building on a location that should be a 20-story building. So you hear my frustration, and you know it's just not directed at city planning. I, I mean, city planning did its technical job. Thank you, that's your job. But boy, I hope the administration is hearing that this city council member and the district I represent are none too pleased. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, council member. I, I hear your, we hear your frustration and it is certainly, certainly worth looking at, we agree. Thank you. Uh, I know council member uh, Chin has a question. Uh, thank you, chair. Um, thank you for the testimony. Um, my concern is that can you make a commitment to start phase two as quickly as possible? because uh, Lower Manhattan is not included um, in this phase one, and we're getting tall buildings, one taller than the other. Um, and I think that we need protections, and you have to really expand the area that, that you look at. And I think when you talk about you know, including Lower Manhattan in phase two, we wanna see if you can do that as soon as possible. Absolutely, Council Member Chen, you have our commitment that, uh, that we are looking, that we will look at this right away and the commitment would be um, that the study be completed by the end of the summer, this summer. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member uh, Levine for a couple of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your great work on this issue. Building on Councilmember Rosenthal's comments, I fear we have gotten lost in the technicalities and are losing sight of the big picture here. And the big picture is that we have a zoning code from 1961 that used floor area limitations within the constraints of technology of that time, uh, the financing realities of the real estate markets at that time and the existing legal techniques and was in effect a very successful limit on height and the size of buildings. And uh, technological changes and financial changes and ever more acrobatic legal maneuvers have totally upended what any fair person understands as the intent of, of the last major uh, citywide zoning uh, regime that we established. Uh, in 1961. Um, and the use of these large voids is, is undoubtedly the most extreme, egregious example of undermining the intent here. And I think part of the disconnect with some of the council members is that the developers don't really care about large contiguous voids. <laughs> we, in a sense, don't really care about large contiguous voids. This is a battle over height. And if you close one technical route to excessive height while leaving several more open, developers are simply going to divert to the other avenues. So closing the option of adding height with a large contiguous void of 100 plus feet while leaving it possible to have many voids spaced throughout the building or to simply remove the facade around those voids and call them unenclosed, uh, leaving even bigger loopholes in commercial areas, um, it's just gonna divert their technique. And, and so our, our frustration 
uh, is not that you haven't fulfilled the narrow mission of limiting uh, large contiguous voids, uh, because what you're proposing, uh, from what I can tell, would crack down on that, and that, and that is a welcome step in the right direction. But uh, just like water finds a way to flow downhill, developers are going to find other routes to do exactly the same thing, which is undermining the intent of the existing uh, regiment. And as a city, we may, may be no better off. Um, and we may see just as many out of scale buildings uh, as we're currently seeing. Um, I, I, I just want to ask one question uh, and then I'll pass it back to the chair. If you can explain the um, circumstances in commercial districts and for mixed-use buildings. There's a, a, a major trend, as you well know, in putting residential buildings in commercial areas, uh, most notably in FIDI, but elsewhere around the city. And so um, if we don't tackle that, we're leaving a huge door open. And if you could explain the, the, the uh, circumstances in which a mixed-use building would be exempt, uh, because I fear, again, that uh, developers would put just enough of a mix of commercial versus residential to once again avoid the new constraints. Sure. I can answer the, the, the degree that uh, mixed building will be captured by the rules. Um, so the, the way that the rules work are if, the, if um, a building is providing less than 25% of its floor area um, as commercial or community facility or some other non-residential use, then the entire building is captured by that. Um, that actually uh, captures the majority of the project area because the majority of the project area is a C1 or C2 district that only permits two FAR of commercial use. So inherently, if your residential district permits 10 FAR or 12 FAR, depending on whether you're providing inclusionary housing, you're kind of capped at 20% automatically. Um, the remaining area is, allows you know, significantly more commercial FAR, but as you say, we've been seeing a lot of residential being developed in those districts, um, and we think that that will predominantly be the prevailing use in those buildings uh, so that they will be captured by the rule, um, that they will provide more than 70% of their floor area as residential. We've carved out the buildings that don't provide um, more than 75% just so that we are not inadvertently capturing community buildings that are providing community facilities um, in large amounts. So we don't want to capture research facilities. We don't want to capture schools. We want to let them be. Um, but the ones that are doing something small, we want to capture the entire building. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel. Uh, Ed Bosco, Holly uh, Rothkoff, William Brightbill, uh, Sina Reddy and Lizette Chaparro. Lizette, we'll start, we'll start with you. If you can just make sure the microphone is on and just state your name, you can begin. And we're, uh, I just want to let everybody know we're limiting it to two minutes. Uh, we have a, a large number of people that want to testify, so uh, please uh, try to be as uh, close to two minutes as possible. Thank you. Understood. Uh, good afternoon again, Chair Moya and uh, council members. Uh, my name is Lizette Chaparro, and I'm here on behalf of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, to deliver a testimony in support of this text amendment. Um, our office has looked at uh, 16 developments, developments throughout Manhattan that all uh, employ or propose to employ a variety of zoning loopholes. And we're here to highlight that the mechanical void is really just one of those zoning loopholes. Um, the uh, proposed uh, zoning text here um, itself should be strengthened in addressing that one loophole. Um, DCP's own study stated um, that uh, mechanical floors are located typically either midway through a building or, quote, regularly located every 10 to 20 stories, unquote. 
Um, given that uh, finding, uh, the borough president believes that uh, the clustering threshold should be raised from 75 feet uh, to 90, 90 feet, um, which is about uh, nine stories, and that the uh, rounding provision should be eliminated um, when calculating floor area. There are plenty of zoning districts throughout the city that have um, decimals in their FAR calculation. Uh, as was mentioned just earlier, um, the 25 feet was um, raised to 30 feet, and the borough president believes it should re remain at 25 feet, and um, that uh, this text should apply, um, as has been discussed as well, to enclosed area uh, floor areas, um, and that the text apply to um, the area that's known as Billionaire's Row. Just two weeks after certifying this application, developers filed for demolition on two sites in this area. And if no action is taken at this juncture, we may see exactly the kind of development that this text uh, aims to prevent. Um, and finally, um, the borough president is calling for a more comprehensive approach to this issue um, and to address other zoning loopholes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Will Breitbelt. I serve as the district manager of Community Board 8 in Manhattan, and I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Alita Camp, our chair. Um, thank you, Chair Moya and members of the council uh, for hearing our testimony. We hope that the suggestions will be taken into consideration when examining this and any future text amendments on this topic. Uh, first, we want to thank council members Kalos and council member Powers and friends of the Upper East Side for their leadership on this issue. On February 20th, Community Board 8 overwhelmingly approved a resolution in support of the proposed zoning text amendment for mechanical voids with recommendations for changes to uh, for changes and the closure of additional loopholes. I provided a copy of that resolution with our testimony. Um, Community Board 8 recognizes the need for closing loopholes that, has, that have been exploited to, for the construction of tall and out-of-context buildings. The board believes that by curtailing the use of mechanical voids to add to building height, the proposed amendment takes a correct, a correct initial step to maintain New York City as a livable city. However, CB8 also believes that there is more work that should be done in closing these loopholes and other loopholes. Um, as technology changes, necessary, necessary mechanical equipment can often fit into smaller and smaller spaces, and we believe that this should be reflected in the amendment. While we believe that the height of the voids should have been brought closer to the average of 12 to 15 feet, we understand uh, that is outside the scope on this uh, conversation. Therefore, CB8 urges the council to return the height of the voids to 25 feet, as was presented to community boards um, by city planning earlier this year. CB8 also is concerned that the language in the amendment provides a blueprint for developers on how to continue to use voids to add additional significant and inappropriate uh, height to their buildings. While the future development might, compl might comply with the letter of the law, we risk providing a roadmap that would damage our neighborhoods and communities. In addition, CB8 believes that unenclosed spaces, terraces, and patios should be a part of the amendment because, as has been threatened with the proposed development in CB8, all that has to be done for the void to remain is strip the exterior cladding. Uh, we also recommend that the amendment apply to commercial districts as well as uh, residential districts. And finally, the board urges the city to close additional loopholes such as the use of stilts, gerrymandered, zo gerrymandered zoning lots, inappropriate floor to ceiling heights, and any other loopholes that are used to create inflated building heights. We call for a mindful, conscientious approach to permissible construction that is context of contextually sized buildings. Manhattan Community Board 8, along with uh, Manhattan Gr Borough President, have all raised concerns with the proposal uh, in their recommendations and have called for additional and tighter protections for our communities. We look forward to the council responding to these proposals as, th these, uh, as this proposal moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Just one, one quick announcement. Uh, sanitation has been moved to the 16th floor uh, at 250 Broadway, so if anyone is here for that committee, uh, please head over to the 16th floor at 250 Broadway. Uh, thank you and apologies um, for that. You may proceed. Uh, my name is Seema Reddy and I speak today on behalf of Manhattan Community Board 7, representing the Upper West Side as co-chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to thank our elected officials, council members Mark Levine, Helen Rosenthal, and um, particularly Ben Kalos for their support and leadership on this issue. We wholeheartedly approve of the Department of City Planning's intention to address the loophole of excessively tall mechanical voids in residential buildings, but after extensive discussion amongst the experts on our board and with our neighbors, we found the text amendment did not go far enough to address even current development in our district, much less the looming future. 
depending on your reading of the original proposed text amendment, a quarter to a third of every hundred feet could still be allocated to mechanical voids. The revisions of the text amendment that was approved by City Planning Commission further relaxes the breakpoint of the original text amendment to 30 feet instead of the original 25. We at CB7 issued a resolution that, among other things, requested the maximum height of an allowed mechanical void to be 20 feet and that such voids be limited to no more than 40 feet uh, in height, however distributed within the building. The vast majority of the testimony to the City Planning Commission requested that the text amendment be made more stringent in the interests of adequately closing this loophole. We are, however, left with a proposal that went in the other direction, not fully addressing the loophole at all. Put in a difficult position, CB7 recognizes that having this text amendment is better than having nothing at all. However, we support a rollback to the original proposed and studied 25-foot maximum height limit for voids and hope you take this into consideration. Thanks. My name is Holly Rothkopf. I'm here representing Save Central Park NYC. I'd like to read my state, our statement. We believe that undermining of the zoning resolution in order to maximize profits requires immediate action. We need growth and predictability that makes sense. Empty space does not address the need for more growth, and this text amendment ignores the intent of zoning regulations. We cannot fathom how the Department of City Planning's text amendment has such a limited scope. It appears that the outcome was determined at the outset. Their own research contradicts what will be the final result. While we applaud the city for finding a framework to address the mechanical void loophole, the void text amendment that DCP has issued in response falls short of providing meaningful relief in closing zoning loopholes, including mechanical voids. The mayor himself assured us last June that the department would look at all voids. The DCP mechanical void text allows for 30 feet of void space for mechanicals before the space is counted towards FAR and allows voids to be separated by 75 feet. This result is not supported by city planning's own research of 796 buildings since 2007 which showed that only a limited number had mechanical floors and that those floors were typically only 10 to 12 feet in height. Seven buildings used voids, six of which were obscenely excessive. Nor is it supported by other facts. Rather, the real estate industry's proposed 30-foot no-count for mechanicals is premised on a hypothetical future need for taller equipment when we are increasingly living in a world in which equipment can be and is made smaller. We urge you to make DCP's text amendment as strong as possible. Unfortunately, we've been told by specialists that 25 feet rather than 30 feet allowed for mechanical voids is the only change you can make at this time. We urge the City Council to push for more substantive measures, including changing the allowable uh, no-count void height, Sorry. specifying an area that includes additional additional blocks west 56th and west 58th between 5th and 6th that are now threatened, unenclosed spaces, terraces and open voids, floor area calculations should not be rounded. We look to you to ensure that this first loophole is closed in a meaningful way. The original zoning resolution was enacted to protect our right to light, air and open space in response to two tall buildings in 1916. With new building techniques, we need this protection now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Bosco, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies. We represent 300 engineering firms across the state that design and uh, supervise the construction of these buildings. I've been an engineer for more than 30 years. I've chaired the ACC uh, Mechanical Code for five years. And with about 50 of our members, I've been on the committees that have rewritten the New York City Building Code since 2005. So I, I came with a lot of statements, but really I think it's a simpler one. Uh, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about going backwards, we're talking about buildings that have built in the past 10 years. And over the past 10 years, the city of New York has really recognized that we need to build buildings differently. So we've been spending these years advancing energy codes, figuring out better ways to build these buildings. And the buildings are not going to look the same as they used to. Uh, typically, 20 years ago, we would put an air handler in, we'd run the air up, we'd build a toilet exhaust out the top of the building. The future codes are going to require that we bring that toilet exhaust back to the same floor where the air handler was, take the energy out of it, put it into the air we're bringing into the building to save energy. That's the equipment that's bigger than the equipment we have today. And that's what led us to the 30-foot requirement. We know we can do it in about 20 feet. If we start building it on a transfer floor, which is a floor where the column grid from uh, a, a commercial space changes to the column grid of a residential space, uh, we lose about 10 or 15 feet just to that. 
and the original text as it was written when we testified back at city planning, the text was uh, measuring a distance from the floor slab to the underside of structure, which we believe needed to be 30 feet. If you look at the current text of this, uh, this draft, it now measures floor to floor, which has taken that 10 or 15, potentially 20 feet of structural uh, beam girder, pushed it back into the mechanical space. So the current text of this amendment leaves you with potentially five feet of mechanical space to work in on these floors. So the, the document is flawed as it is, but we are, we, we came here to solve a problem that's about five, six, seven hundred feet of overbuild, and we're talking about a foot or two either way now. So we really thought there was no point in trying to to argue down one or two feet smaller on the floor to floor when our problem was much bigger than that and we should really be addressing that and the, the, the CPC uh, document solved that. We, we believe that the, the disincentive provided by the original document was enough to stop what we're seeing and really being objecting to what we're. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Council Member Kalos for Few questions. I want to thank the uh, zoning chair for his indulgence. He's pointed out there are a number of people waiting, so customarily ask a lot of questions. We're just going to try to do one question per panel. Uh, both uh, Manhattan Borough President, President Gail Brewer's office, Community Board 8, and Safe Central Park and others have asked for uh, us to amend further than 25 feet. Uh, I've been advised that the furthest we can get is 25 feet. We can't go to 12 or 15. Do any of you have any, uh, anything to support it, whether in the law or in testimony that would allow us to, to be more aggressive and as aggressive as we'd like? Council Member Kalos, uh, just a clarification. The borough president um, did not uh, comment on the 25 feet that were originally proposed. Um, that um, figure seemed fine to us. Um, we did hear a lot of testimony in support of a 25-foot mechanical floor. Okay. Board 8. Um, yes, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Um, in our original resolution, which you guys have a copy of, we did ask for, for tightening that, that number. Um, but it is my understanding that, that within the scope that, that you guys have, that going back to 25 is as far as it can go. Um, so we thank you if you will move it to 25. And, and C is CBA currently considering a zoning text amendment for 210 feet for affordability? Uh, yes, that, that is under consideration. We're working with uh, our local elected officials and nonprofit advocacy groups in our neighborhood on exploring um, a height cap or down zoning in certain areas of our district where we are seeing uh, exploitation of these sorts of loopholes. Um, so that would be another opportunity that we could have to uh, curb some of these, these loopholes. But, but right now, the, the project in front of us is this. And uh, we really thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you to city planning and uh, the council. Okay. And thank you to CB7 as well. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, I would like to call up the next panel. Uh, Rachel Levy, uh, Simon Bankoff, uh, Josette. Amato and Gus uh, Epson. If you can just turn on the microphone, state your name, and, and you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chair Moya and Council Members. My name is Rachel Levy, and I'm with Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. We are pleased uh, that DCP has put forth a proposal to address one piece of the void problem, and although it is a critical first step in curtailing the scale and frequency of excess mechanical void space, it is far too narrow to fully address the, the mechanical void issue, and as you know, it does not begin to address the other zoning loopholes. We are particularly disappointed that the City Planning Commission further weakened the threshold for exemption to 30 feet, disregarding the DCP staff's own study which found no examples of buildings with legitimate mechanical space needs at this scale. We now look to the City Council to roll back the 30-foot language and continue to hold DCP accountable to a meaningful follow-up action. 
As you've heard, this amendment does not address unenclosed voids or stilts, um, and it will therefore not impact 249 East 62nd Street, which is um, particularly absurd um, from our perspective as this building has been a leading catalyst for both Friends and DCP's work on this issue. Unenclosed voids and stilts present the very same issues of predictability, public safety, and scale as their enclosed counterparts, and they serve no functional purpose apart from artificially boosting upper stories. Until such spaces are counted toward zoning floor area, the amendment will undoubtedly incentivize the use of this loophole. Additionally, we look to the City Council to support a broader application of this text, one that impacts broader geographies and uses, including commercial buildings. Exploitation of zoning loopholes is complex and requires a multi-pronged approach. The void text amendment is weak, though it can, be, can and should be made stronger by the City Council. In phase two, we urge a broad expansion of scope to look at more of the zoning loopholes, including a thorough study of alternative policy proposals, as well as solutions used in other municipalities. If such steps are taken, we believe this can be a positive first step in the city addressing these issues. Friends supports an approval of the zoning text amendment with modifications as the city's first step to address this package of civic concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Simeon Bankoff, Historic Districts Council. First of all, I would like to thank the council, particularly uh, council member Kalos and Manhattan Borough President Brewer for, her, for their leadership on this issue and also my colleagues in the preservation and civic world for their attention to it. I'm here today to support this amendment to say that it's not go far, nearly far enough. We look forward to seeing stronger, more robust reforms from city government in order to guide the development of the city in order to encourage growth and continued vitality while protecting and protecting and preserving our city's historic neighborhoods. We're depending on those reforms to be brought forward and are buoyed by city planning's statements on these on that issue. However, we are <clears throat> Concerned about the scheduling, we hope that the follow-up action can be scheduled sooner rather than later. The initial survey took more than a year. If we project out a similar timeline, it could be a race to get this accomplished by the end of this administration. With regard to the specifics of the slight proposal before you now, CPC's revision to allowable um, revision to a allowable 30-foot voids instead of the already too generous 25-foot allowance is absurd. Although this is a citywide text change, you might not see many community members from the other boroughs here today. It is not because this specific proposal only affects high-rise districts. It's because they don't understand the very notion of allowable mechanical voids. I've been talking about this to involved community members from across the city for the past few months, and it has been met with vast incredulity. The people I've been speaking with can't believe that this abuse of mechanical voids was allowable to begin with. These are the homeowners who are proud of their neighborhoods, who invest in their neighborhoods, who are united in mass to oppose the um, proposed increase of 10 feet in contextual zones under the adopted MIH ZQA rezoning. They honestly did not believe that this current loophole existed. While an additional five feet might seem academic to the high-rise districts of the city and to the people who deal with real estate development every day, the difference of five feet matters to people on the street and people who care about their neighborhoods. Five feet of additional height and especially a series of cumulative five-foot increases in height, and that's what we're really talking about here, blocks the sky and erodes the notion of rational planning in that it values a, maximiza a maximization of private land value over public goods. That's not right. Please return the allowable spaces to a maximum of 25 feet as it was originally intended, and please do all you can to ensure the administration and city planning do everything they can do to fix this endemic and egregious problem. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, Council members. I'm Josette Amato, the Executive Director of West End Preservation Society. I come before you today to ask you to modify the City Planning Commission's findings and restore some sanity into the current situation. A few architects and developers have exploited current regulations. If not technically breaking the rules, they are most certainly breaking their spirit to favor the few at the expense of the many. We are grateful the City Planning Commission recognized this abuse and endeavored to right the wrong. However, their result is woefully inadequate. Instead of heeding their own research and the overwhelming recommendations at the public hearing, they ignored almost every point. The only voices heard were from industry representatives. The majority of their research, the majority of speakers based on research requested the mechanical void threshold be reduced. Their answer was to increase the height. 
The Commission believed it was important the text amendment not hinder a resilient or energy efficient building, but there would be no hindrance because nothing prohibits a developer from incorporating any size void they need or want. It's just that anything above the cap would count toward FAR. We requested the clustering of voids be expanded to the outside limit of DCP's research, 200 feet. The 75 foot limit remains. If passed, this council will produce all new buildings with 30 foot voids every 76 feet. We need more housing and we'd be thrilled to see exciting designs creating a beautiful streetscape, but that's not what's happening. We are truly building castles in the sky. We are condemning great swaths of land and people to darkness so an elite few can bask in the light. These regulations will do nothing to prevent empty space in the center of buildings for the sole purpose of increasing height for more expensive views. We ask your help in strengthening these amendments. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gus Epson. I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Assemblymember Linda B. Rosenthal, who represents the Upper West Side and parts of Hell's Kitchen uh, in the 67th Assembly District. I testified in March 2019 at the Department of City Planning hearing on the proposed text amendment, stating then that the proposal was far too developer friendly, doing little but codify an existing loophole. Unfortunately, the inadequate plan presented then has only been further weakened, with developers now being allowed 30 feet of mechanical space every 75 feet. All this despite the fact that not a single building the city studied in the year and a half it took to prepare this amendment required mechanical space of 30 feet. The city council has a critical opportunity and an urgent priority to drastically strengthen the text amendment as presented. New York City is in a housing affordability crisis. Nearly half of our city's tenants are rent burdened. We simply do not have any space in this great city for super towers filled with empty space that use the generosity of our zoning code to perch penthouses on stilts. To move ahead with the plan presented today would invite developer exploitation to a degree we have only seen previously in isolated instances. DCP has thus far identified seven buildings with void space between 80 feet and 190 feet, but approval of the plan as presented would guarantee the right of every new developer in our city to increase their total building height nearly 30% without being docked any floor area ratio allotment. While I encourage the city to carry out a phase two of this amendment process, there is no reason to not tackle this loophole right now. At the state level, I've introduced legislation that seeks to comprehensively address the mechanical voids issue, while also addressing some of the broader challenges of exploitive development. The legislation which amends the multiple dwelling law is currently sponsored by more than 30 state representatives, the vast majority of whom represent districts within the five boroughs. My legislation will require that all void space exceeding 20 feet or 5% of total building height be counted towards total FAR, with each additional 12 feet of void space being counted as an additional floor afterwards. The legislation will count any residential ceiling height in excess of 12 feet as an additional floor and will ensure that open space, such as balconies, still, spaces on stilts, and terraces not bordered by full walls be counted towards the, the total FAR. Uh, in conclusion, I would just ask that we would just ask that the council look at DCP's very data um, and we, we appreciate the opportunity to testify here today and look forward to working with you. Thank you. One, one question, please. Uh, thank you all for your testimony, uh, in particular to Assemblymember Rosenthal, thank you for the partnership in trying to get this done on the state level. If we can't get something more aggressive done on the local level. Uh, to uh, friends in HDC, your organizations have been focused on this since the beginning. Uh, why focus on the loophole uh, versus a uh, 210 foot height cap? and uh, how does this improve versus the status quo, which I think uh, the save uh, the West End, uh, what's the group's? Preservation Society. West End Preservation Society, I think, touched on as well. Um, so friends had originally studied a 210 foot uh, height cap proposal as well. Um, in looking at how we might um, limit overdevelopment on the Upper East Side in particular. And through study, I think we found that going at this through the loopholes would be able, would accomplish a greater um, impact in terms of the change and, and really close the fundamental issues that are contributing to overdevelopment in our neighborhood without um, the unintended consequences that a height cap may, may bring along with it. Um, well, I'm relying mostly on friends as a report, but regardless, the fact is that once you start talking about absolute height caps 
um, it becomes a, a very difficult situation and people find their ways around it by, deter by determining loopholes that violate those height caps more often than not. Additionally, looking at it from a citywide perspective, I very much agree with what Rachel says, that um, it's in the loopholes of this is only one of them that is afflicting the kind of unregulated development throughout our city. And there are many other issues, um, subdivisions, et cetera, that also need to be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the, uh, your panel, for the panel um, and your testimony. I'm now going to call up uh, the next panel, which is Mark uh, Diller, uh, E.J. Kalafarsky, and Chris uh, Giordano. Just make sure that uh, the red light is on uh, so that your microphone is on and uh, just please state your name and you can uh, begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is Mark Diller. I'm a member of Community Board 7 on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, although our official testimony was provided by the chair of our land use committee, Seema Reddy, uh, so I'm speaking on my own behalf. Um, the, um, the problem that we're confronting here arises out of uh, what, 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 what I heard first as an old joke, which was when you run short of money, the developer wants to build only half the building, the top half. And what we have here is a first step at trying to confront a realization of that conundrum that's now come to pass, certainly in my district and we've heard in many others as well. Um, it is, however, only a first step, and I know you've heard testimony on this before, so uh, I'll just reiterate the, the, the emphasize the one point that, um, that, that, that we've described in our resolution, which I believe you have, that a 30-foot void out of every 100 would still allow a building to be about a third taller than you would expect reasonably that building to be. Um, the floor-to-floor -floor ceiling heights combined with these voids could create enormous buildings that are out of character in a number of our areas. I chair our uh, Historic Preservation Committee and the effects of these towers on our historic structures is also um, quite real. The vice that we're trying to confront here is the rush to have an as-of-right solution for every problem. And my, sub su my suggestion to you is that that's not always possible that creating an as-of-right solution, especially one where you have, you're, you're providing for the extreme case in the general rule is one that is bad policy and should be avoided. There should be a streamlined process to address outlying conditions. So for those reasons, um, I join with my colleagues on Community Board 7 in recommending approval of this uh, text amendment and seeking additional protections. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is E.J. Kalifarski, and I'm a member of Manhattan Community Board 5. Community Board 5 uh, supports the closure of the, of the mechanical voids loophole, and we urge the City Council to vote on the text as soon as possible. But we absolutely believe that the text must go further. Allowing 25-foot mechanical rooms is excessive. 30 feet is certainly unacceptable and goes against the findings of the DCP experts who conducted the citywide survey of mechanical spaces in the first place. Allowing mechanical rooms every 75 feet is also excessive. In essence, it will codify the loophole rather than closing it. It will still allow excessively tall buildings using this artifice, and the numbers should be much more conservative. It's essential to note that the text does not restrict or prohibit anything. It merely ma makes excessively large mechanical spaces count towards FAR. Therefore, developers would still have total design freedom. A revised formula with more conservative numbers would produce shorter buildings that would be less impacting to their surroundings than the ones studied in the EAS. Therefore, reducing the size of standard mechanical floors is within the scope of this proposal. 
Given that the EAS prepared by DCP carefully surveyed 800 buildings citywide and is not site specific, it's also clear that any areas in R9 and R10 and their commercial equivalents are part of the scope of the zoning text amendment. Community Board 5 is unfortunately ground zero for mechanical voids. Out of the seven problem buildings identified by the Department of City Planning in their survey, four are in CB5. These are the monster towers that everybody hates on 57th Street. Yet the current amendment does not include 57th Street. It is of enormous importance that this current proposal address the issue where the issue is actually occurring. A minor mo map modification would achieve this urgent purpose. We urge the City Council to vote on this text as soon as possible and, to support, and, and we support a strong follow-up action by DCP that will eliminate all the zoning loopholes. Enclosed mechanical rooms, unenclosed areas, and all the subterfuges that allow ridiculously tall buildings in our district. Thank you. My name is Chris Giordano. I'm here on behalf of the 64 through 67 Streets Block Association. We thank you for hearing the concerns of our neighborhoods, neighborhoods all over New York City, and considering this text amendment to New York City's zoning resolution. With regard to our neighborhood, which is facing a building, 36 West 66th Street, planned with hundreds of feet of void space, we feel it necessary to remind city planning and the council here that just 26 years ago, our community went through the process of creating the Lincoln Square Special District Zoning Resolution at which time city planning is on record as stating that the controls in place should predictably regulate the heights of new development, and these controls would sufficiently regulate the resultant building form and scale, even in the case of development involving zoning lot mergers. People speak of the importance of predictability and reliability in zoning regulations. Our community thought it had solved for predictability and reliability 26 years ago, and then the developers began exploding these loopholes. And now city planning proposes that you codify these loopholes. We believe that voids do nothing to create housing for our city's growth, density to solve housing affordability, neighborhood amenities to support infrastructure and quality of life, nor is it the missing tool for architects to express themselves more creatively. Further, it is a slap in the face to what our community work hard to establish in the Lincoln Square Special District Zoning Resolution. Countless community board meetings, discussions with elected representatives, and even city planning's own research pointed toward the need for 12-foot mechanical spaces with 200 feet of space between them. At the city planning hearing, nobody testified to the benefit of void space. Ultimately, our community sees this as a moral issue. We don't want to be judged by history as the society that allowed buildings with hundreds of feet of vertical space, uh, with hundreds of vertical feet of unused space to be built. Council members, we're in it for the long haul. Let's get it right. Please don't make a bad situation worse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, before I call up the next panel, uh, I just want to turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal, uh, who wants to um, make a few comments. I, sorry, I'm in two hearings at the same time, and I don't know that you can see that but I'm also over at the contracts hearing right now where I have an important piece of legislation to bring our contract cost under control. So I'm going back and forth between the two. I really want to thank my community for coming out and testifying. Um, I'm sorry I missed some of their testimony. Of course, I had somebody here in the room listening and we appreciate all the advice that you know, you've, it's been a pleasure working together with you over the last uh, months. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to call up the next panel. Um, I want to call up Tara Kelly, Lynn Ellsworth, Joseph uh, Coella, and Gary Pomerantz. Yes, I have copies for everyone as well. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can just state your name uh, and uh, you may begin. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, council members. I'm Rachel Mazur. I'm the Menapes Fellow at the Municipal Arts Society. MAS believes that the Residential Tower Mechanical Void Text Amendment to the zoning resolution proposed by DCP is a step in the right direction towards regulating excessive void space in residential buildings and high density tower districts. However, the proposal does not go far enough to close zoning loopholes and comprehensively regulate mechanical and structural voids. We recommend modifications to the current proposal to broaden its physical and geographical scope and maximize its potential effectiveness. MAS would support the text amendment proposal if the following recommendations were included. First, that restrictions apply to unenclosed structural voids, including stilts, terraces, and outdoor spaces in addition to mechanical voids. Second, that the geographical scope of the provisions of the text amendment is extended citywide. Third, that provisions of the text amendment apply to commercial buildings as well as residential buildings. Fourth, that an oversight committee or task force comprising representatives from DCP and DOB is formed to ensure that new regulations are enforced. And finally, that for each mechanical floor, DOB will assess, based on volumetric plans submitted by each applicant, whether a percentage of space occupied by mechanical equipment is justified. A percentage of overall space or threshold will be established by DCP and met by each applicant. We urge DCP to define the percentages slash thresholds in coordination with DOB and input from construction industry and engineering sources before the next iteration of the text amendment in fall 2019. We appreciate the effort of the city that the city has made to amend the zoning resolution to regulate mechanical voids. It is a good first step in a much larger discussion involving decision makers, the public, and stakeholders to arrive at, a real, at realistic solutions, ensuring that the text amendment is truly effective. Thank you. Yeah, you may begin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hello again. Uh, I am Joseph Colella, and I am here on behalf of the New York Building Congress, which includes more than 550 constituent organizations in New York City's design, construction, and real estate industry. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the proposed text amendment on behalf of the Building Congress. We agree with the goal of advancing new regulations regarding the allowable height of mechanical spaces in New York City. However, it is vital to ensure that any significant change to zoning law goes through the proper process for evaluating the impacts of such a change. We feel strongly that the current proposal has not gone through the thorough vetting that is customarily afforded to substantial changes in zoning law. In the past months, a significant number of architects, engineers, and other members of the Building Congress have raised serious concerns about this proposal. Experts have noted that the proposed 25-foot height limit on mechanical spaces on the prohibition on stacking of mechanical spaces do not align with industry best practices and would make it far more difficult to advance many new projects. It is now clear that the most appropriate step would be to withdraw the current proposal and take additional time to engage with architects, engineers, and other experts to gather recommendations and determine a more sensible path forward. The standard review process around potential zoning changes should remain. This could establish a dangerous precedent for as of right development moving forward. As we have previously noted, if the development pipeline suffers a slowdown and new projects cannot get off the ground, the city would also lose out on a much needed tax revenue and many new construction jobs. It is our suggestion that the council pause and revise the plans, starting with the feedback gathered here today. We recognize that the city council has already made incredible strides to build a stronger city, but since we cannot support this proposal in its current form, we sincerely hope that the council will make the right decision and explore alternatives. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on an issue of such importance to our community. Thank you. Is that better? No. I'm Lynn Ellsworth with Human Scale NYC. I'll skip over the introductory part, um, but I want to point out that one of the effects of these loopholes is often not talked about. They lead even ordinary developers to dump their mechanical equipment at the level of the street wall, creating noise, pollution, and entire blocks of dead space. It's the antithesis of what Jane Jacobs advocated for cities, and the anti-clustering part of this will do nothing to solve it because we're talking about clusters of 30 feet, which is everything you see at street wall. And I am brokenhearted to have to break with some of my colleagues and allies here, speak the truth as I understand it. The proposal will do nothing to fix the problem. It literally represents 
a needless and unnecessary giveaway to developers. It codifies the worst, not the best practice, and will likely result in hundreds of new buildings that will, not, that will be built to take advantage of what will turn out to be a new 30-foot or 25-foot loophole. It might solve the problem for a single building on the Upper East Side, but it will help no one else. At the DCP hearing, all of us asked for a 12-foot height cap on the mechanical floors. Rebney stood up and said they wanted 35 feet, and now mysteriously, the number is 30 feet. DCP ignored all pleas for reason and transparency. You should not ignore that. Another point is that even the 12-foot height number was a giveaway. And here's why, and this is something I really need to elaborate on. Of the 800 buildings built over the past 10 years that city cl planning claims to have done research on, only seven had floors devoted to voids. DCP has no knowledge whatsoever of the height of mechanical floors because they did not do the research to measure those floors. They did not measure the volume of void space. They did not measure the number of void spaces. They did not separate mechanical spaces. As a researcher, I am a researcher, I would fire whoever did that. Now, they're going around the city claiming they did research and we're all like, oh, they did research. I'm sorry, but we have been exposed to massive misrepresentation at the part of the so-called research that DCP did. So how can they do better research in the year to come on the void spaces? We urge you to just kill this, start over. Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes, are we? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Gary Pomerantz. I'm the Executive Vice President at WSP Engineers. I've been practicing engineering for 40 years. Uh, I'm going to have to do this faster. Uh, I'd like to say, start by saying that the 20, 25, 30 foot is kind of arbitrary and an in, in, in inadequate minimal uh, permitted height to say. If we have to pick a height, I would start at 35 feet. Why? Buildings now are mixed use. They're more complicated. Uh, each space has to have its own mechanical systems, either by code or by good practice, which takes area and it takes height in the building. Um, structural transitions often occur in the mechanical spaces, and to deal with them, there are usually very large, deep beams, 10, 15 feet deep, and the area under the beam, if we had a 25 foot height, might be as low as 10 feet, inadequate. At, 25, at 30 feet, it might be 15 feet high, so by the time we put two-foot diameter pipes and three-foot high ducts under it, again, the floor-to-floor -floor height is inadequate. That's why we're pushing for a minimum of 35 feet. Not that we're going to use it in all cases. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, also, due to different ownerships in buildings where a rental apartment zone ends and the condominium zone starts, it's usually either by law or by the lawyer's requirements to have different mechanical systems serving the different parts of the building. If you don't do one floor, you do two floors in mechanical. Two floors is going to add up to more than the requirements that are being proposed by, by the council or by the city. Uh, energy code we went over, but I'm going to just conclude because we have 30 seconds left. So really, buildings should be designed to serve the current requirements and try to anticipate and be adaptable for future requirements, right? The MER space should be appropriate to allow for proper maintenance, the proper original installation, and the safe operation of the building. Set them a maximum height to, uh, to 25 feet, 20 feet, even 30 feet. It may not provide the, the adequate space that's required. If we have to choose a height, like I said, 35 feet would be more appropriate to serve these spaces. But I will say, except for one building, I fight for every inch of height in every building I do and every square foot of floor area. It's not an issue about fixing mechanical room heights in buildings and spacing. It's a more fundamental issue that should not explicitly limit the height of the mechanical rooms. I invite the council to come to our buildings that I've designed and see how tight the mechanical rooms are. Thank you. I will now turn it over for uh, a brief question from Council Member Kalos. Thank the Zoning Chair for the indulgence. I want to thank Lynn Ellsworth for your advocacy and your research and testimony. In your testimony, you note uh, a building I'm actually familiar with, and I'm going to direct it to the other folks. Uh, this is going to be the largest passive house residential building in America, I believe. It's being built by, proposed by Fetner for infill in my district. And if you look at the diagram, and Lynn is showing it to other panelists, it has no mechanical floors in the building. It is 49 stories. Uh, so to the building con Chris and the architect, why do you need a 35 foot or larger uh, mechanical space if brand new, state of the art, best passive house, best environmental building in the country doesn't even have them? That's for you, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, for the research. Um, 
So uh, your question again is, if this building has the uh, does not have a mechanical floor, why should we have a 35 foot allowance? Yes. Um, Honestly, this is the first building that we've seen that doesn't have this mechanical floor, but this isn't the norm in New York City, no? I walk around New York City every day and most buildings have the mechanicals up top. Yes. The new mechanicals in between is a new occurrence. Yes. Uh, well, we just asked that the council um, pause and revise the plans based on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists for their testimony today. Uh, I am now going to bring up um, Bash uh, Gerhards. Gerhards. Uh, Andrea Goldwyn. Andrew Berman. So with you, Andrea. Yes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Chair Moya and uh, Council Member Kalos. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking for the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is pleased that the Department of City Planning heard the voices of elected officials, advocates, and residents from across the city who have seen out of scale, out of context buildings rise in their neighborhoods. These towers bend the intentions of the zoning resolution with voids, stilts, and gerrymandered or sculptured zoning lots, among other loopholes. This amendment addresses one of the most egregious examples by limiting excessive mechanical voids in residential buildings in some communities, but it is much too permissive. The original proposal called for limiting voids to 25 feet we asked for that to be reduced to 12. Instead, it's gone up to 30. At the very least, we call for the council to limit the space that is not counted against FAR to 25. We heard the testimony of engineers at the City Planning Commission hearing and asked that any voids above 25 feet be, excuse me, be counted against FAR. As in almost every other technology, this should incentivize innovation and equipment that fits in a smaller space with adequate clearance. The department has promised to come back to expand the geographic area that the amendment covers. It should be expanded in other ways to include commercial as well as residential. It should be citywide. It should look at all of the ways developers manipulate zoning to boost building heights and count those ways against FAR. The Conservancy is not against tall buildings. We're not against adequate space for mechanical equipment. What we are against are loopholes that developers use when they see the upper limits of the zoning resolution as a starting point for what they want to build. We always hear that developers need certainty. Residents do as well. We urge city planning to come back with a more holistic amendment that creates comprehensive certainty and predictability in zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Andrew Berman, testifying on behalf of Village Preservation, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Unfortunately, the City Planning Commission's voids text amendment would not only do little if not nothing to solve the problem it purports to address, it could arguably make it worse. And shockingly, City Planning actually expanded the gigantic loophole it would grant developers from the original version of this proposal. Uh, the plan explicitly allows one 30-foot tall mechanical floor every 75 feet, thus enshrining in law that new towers can be over 30% empty voids, since it doesn't include the mechanical penthouses, regardless of whether or not the space serves any function whatsoever meriting zoning exception. It also uh, un it allows unlimited enclosed voids to be added to buildings to increase their height and it allows developers to continue to include an unlimited amount of enclosed mechanical void space, space without accounting towards zoning square footage as long as a fraction of the building is dedicated to commercial space and the mechanical void is labeled as commercial rather than residential. What's so particularly shameful about this proposal is that a fair, clear, and rational system which actually did address this problem would be so easy to produce. We could, for example, set an appropriate limit on the percentage of a building which can count as zoning exempt mechanical spaces without any amount which exceeds that counting towards, the, with any amount which exceeds that counting towards the zoning. 
we could define what is necessary mechanical equipment for a residential building and only allow such equipment and the volume necessary to house it to be exempt from zoning. We could make sure these limits apply to mixed-use buildings and not just purely residential ones. And certainly we could raise the required distance between mechanical floors from a meager 75 feet to something much more reasonable like 200 feet. Arguably, legislation is not even needed to do much of this, but could simply be done by promulgating new Department of Buildings rules, providing a clear definition of mechanical voids and not allowing spaces which don't conform to be exempt from zoning. Uh, in summary, we urge the Council to do whatever you can, which is within your power with this proposal, and to push for more and additional uh, measures that would truly address the problem. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Kalos. Thank you again. I believe this is the uh, last panel. Uh, my question to both is your, you, you checked off opposition. Both of you provided conditions to, to the New York Landmarks Conservancy. If the council does, in fact, amend from 30 back to 25, would that satisfy your concerns? And then to uh, GVSHP, uh, in addition to changing it to 25, we've gotten a commitment for them to come back this summer for the commercial spaces uh, in the FIDI, Midtown, and Hudson Yards, as well as a brand new commitment announced at this hearing to conduct a study of unenclosed voids, aka stilt, uh, which would be uh, in the next year or so. Uh, are those, would those be adequate if we were able to accomplish those? Uh, well, at city planning, um, our testimony at, when, at city planning when 25 feet was presented as the proposal, we actually asked for it to be lower. We understand that now to stay in scope, it can only be raised, it, it was raised to 30, it can only go back down to 25. So we think at the very least it should go to 25. Um, and we, as I said, this has been an issue that a lot of communities, a lot of advocates, a lot of neighbors have been concerned about. And we are pleased that city planning is taking steps. Overall, we don't think they're enough. We're not going to say don't do this, but there needs to be a lot more. Yeah, and I would say from our perspective, I, I mean, first of all, politics is the art of the possible, and I know who you're dealing with here with this administration. Um, if they really <laughs> cared about this issue, we wouldn't even have to be here because they could just enforce the regulations in a rational way, and you wouldn't be able to have a room that's 200 feet tall uh, with little or no mechanical equipment in it and have it count as zoning ex exempt. Um, so I understand the desire to get something done that will make some improvements uh, given who you have to work with. Um, that said, I think that uh, just coming back and uh, extending the geographic scope um, certainly doesn't fully address the problem, though that may be the best you're going to get out of this administration. Um, I also think that uh, unenclosed spaces are important. What concerns me about this approach is that you're writing into the law that it's explicitly allowable that you can have empty spaces with no real criteria for what function they serve, and as long as you just label them as mechanical space, they're zoning exempt. Um, and that shouldn't be the case. There should be a much more, um, there should be a different approach that doesn't allow you, regardless of whether it's 30 feet, 100 feet, or 12 feet, if it's not necessary, it shouldn't count. Agreed. Yeah, I'd, Thank I'd you. I'd just like to add to that. Um, it's been our understanding that this has primarily been an issue in Manhattan. We are concerned that once this is codified, if it is, it sort of does set a blueprint for buildings outside the areas we've been talking about and for the entire city to say everyone should have at least a 25-foot void. Uh, just as a point of clarification, this is only available in R9 and R10 tower districts, and the vast majority, I think 80 to 90 percent, have high protections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting and I would like to uh, thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course uh, the very hard working uh, land use staff who have done a tremendous job. Uh, I want to thank Raju, uh, Julie, um, uh, Amy, and of course uh, Arthur, uh, and all the land use uh, staff that uh, make this committee uh, move uh, smoothly. Thank you uh, again, and this meeting is hereby adjourned.